Good morning. Uh, it's nice to be in Ireland. I almost didn't make it here. I got on the plane 60 seconds before they shut the door. Uh, apparently there was a little shootout at Heathrow. Um, and uh, they get nervous when that happens and they stopped all the people on the freeway. So I got to sit on the road, look at the airport and, and my watch realizing it was the last flight. Thinking, well, I could always start later in the day or I could swim. And the guy who was driving me was getting very nervous and I said to him, I said, well, we could always take a ferry. And he said, but they, they, they leave from Hollyhead and they leave from Liverpool. And I said, well, I said, if you don't get me to the airport on time, I said, I have all night. <laughs> but anyway, I was lucky. I got on the plane and it was uh, as nice as we're going down the runway. They were apologizing for us being late because after I rushed all the way through the airport, got in the doors, they closed them. Of course, they made us sit in the plane for another 45 minutes. Uh, if they'd have just told us that, I wouldn't have had to run across the airport. But these people are trained uh, to do things according to rules, not always according to sensory acuity. And some, I guess it was about 35 years ago, uh, I moved into a house that was owned by a psychiatrist. And this is really where NLP started, was is that, because uh, the beginning is, you don't need to take notes, by the way, there was somebody taking notes. Um, if it, this is not something you're going to be tested on later, okay? If you went to college too long and you think you're going to get an examination at the end of the day, we do it differently here. You're getting the examination now. <laughs> Only thing I want to know is the answer to the simple question, how much pleasure can you stand? Because I found out that most of what went on in modern psychiatry, the psychiatrist, by the way, that let me stay in this house was a very nice man. Uh, a bit of a, uh, what's the word they use here? Uh, a mook or something like that, or a moolah. This guy was just not the brightest candle on the cake. Uh, he, you know, he went, to law, he went to law school to become a lawyer, decided after graduating from Harvard he didn't want to be a lawyer, went back to Yale and became a doctor, really good at taking tests, and at the age of 42 became a psychiatrist, went into practice and saw patients and gave them drugs every day, and uh, then he had uh, his midlife crisis, which was good for me, because I got to go stay in this really nice house while I went to college. And he went to India to find himself. Now, I tried to explain to him that he was right there, but he wasn't going for that. He went off to India, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, they dressed him up in funny outfits, and uh, he smoked a lot of dope. And uh, he came back more relaxed, but he still didn't have any idea who he was. Uh, looked me straight in the eye and told me that. He said, I don't know who I am. And I said, uh, how can you not know who you are? And I said, it's impossible to not know who you are. I said, if, you, if somebody says, I don't know who I am, then you go, then how do you know to even ask the question? But see, in the human potential movement 35 years ago, which was a good thing, broke through psychiatry by, by getting it so that uh, wild psychotherapists like Fritz Perls had people talking to empty chairs. Uh, not something that I think is going to make you more sane, by the way. Uh, I've examined this in great detail, and when you're talking to people that no one else sees, um, doesn't mean they're not there, but it definitely is something you should do privately. Uh, that's my theory. Although there are these people called Jehovah's Witnesses that drop by my house that do something that's pretty much the same thing. They come by and they knock on the door. I used to live around the hall from the Kingdom Hall and they knock on the door and they, they always say the, what I consider to be one of the dumbest things you could hear. They say, have you heard about Jesus Christ? I, could you be anywhere on this planet and have not heard about Jesus Christ? Excuse me, there's billions of Christians running around the planet trying to find one person. And I always used to look at them and go, does he live downstairs? <laughs> and they get this look like, at last, someone to convince. And then I would open the door and they would step in the living room and look around and they would see a festival of pagan items. Because if I've traveled for years and years all over the world, people always give me this stuff. In Africa, these ghoulish masks. Uh, I went to Fiji, they give me shrunken heads. I was in India, they gave me these brass things of six-armed Shivas. And so I just put this stuff around my living room. 
It helps to reassure the Jehovah's Witnesses that they're not about to have a good day. <laughs> and when you look at them and say, now why don't you sit for a spell? And I go, I'll listen to what you have to say, and then I have a little deal to offer you. <laughs> that always scares them, that they're worried about their soul. Not me, I can always buy a new pair of shoes. Now what happened is, is as I stayed at this guy's house, I started reading the books, and he had uh, thousands of books. And in all these books, there was not one single thing that you could do. Now think about it, a whole field treating human beings, and the only book that said anything that you could do was called the Physician's Desk Reference. It said if people are depressed, give them one of these. If they're too nervous, give them one of those. And I'd already seen all these pills, and I didn't even go to medical school. You could buy them on the street I lived on. You know, we had different names for them, but they were the same pills. I mean, uh, you know, they called them Valium, you know, and they called them something else. But actually, the street that I lived on in San Francisco, we had better pills than they had. Uh, we had guys making LSD uh, and, you know, and competing to see who could make this back in the 60s. It was legal then. You used to get your LSD from the pharmacy. You go down to your pharmacist and you'd get a lecture about how dangerous it was and then he'd give, tell, show you how to measure it and tell you all about all the good trips he had. Um, I lived in San Francisco in the 60s. You'd go into the pharmacy and they'd have the Grateful Dead playing and the pharmacist would be dancing around in an Indian bedspread, you know. It was, and there'd be a line of people outside going up and down the street, you know. So a lot of sugar cubes in those days, you know. It was a good investment. Sugar futures went way up. But for me, I kept looking at this, and uh, my background was both in physics and in, in, in what was called heuristics, or what's now called computer science. Uh, guys who are my age will, you know, remember words like RKO5s and know what Kennedy tape drives were. Floppy disks were this big, that thick, and they only held a megabyte of information, maybe, usually 1,000K. I had my first computer, my first home computer, was about the size of the stage, and about this high, and would do less than the thing I carry in my pocket now. Um, but, and you know, the problem with having floppy disks this big is where do you put them? And when you go over somebody's house and you're going to trade floppy disks, you really need like a pickup truck. Uh, it's just a whole different thing. But uh, one of the things that we knew that we were trying to do was to model human behavior to get so that human beings would do the behavior. Even simple behavior like accounting. Uh, all the graduate students at Stanford were trying to find statistical variance through wide amounts of data that they had falsified for four years while they were partying. It. And if, they if their data didn't come out right, of course they didn't graduate. So uh, one of the first routines that I wrote was a subroutine, which altered the data correctly, so that all these PhD theses would come out statistical variants. I now read about that research. It's now the way they verify and justify doing things in the field of psychology and medicine. But you see, to me, this whole scientific method was wrong from the get-go. As a scientist, I looked at it and I realized that if the scientific method was the most valuable thing we had, then it didn't account for the simple fact that almost every major innovation in science was found by accident. The scientific method should produce the new things. It should, you shouldn't go, wow, it didn't come out right. We have penicillin. <laughs> That's what, basically what happened. Yeah, people did lab experiments, and, uh, and, and to make sure you really did your lab experiments, they did this little trick where they put bread in there and you grew uh, bacteria on it. It doesn't grow on bread right. And if you uh, did your lab book right, they could tell whether you did it. And finally, one student asked, he said, he said, Professor, how come a bacteria doesn't grow on this mold? And he said, because it doesn't. And that student is the guy who began what we now call antibiotics. 
Now, if it was just that one example, it'd be one thing, but over and over and over through the history of mankind, people keep stumbling onto answers, typically from a different field, because they don't know any better. And not knowing any better is the thing that's gotten me through everything. Because when I read about philosophy in college and how the, everything was one field, and then they had biology and, you know, and mathematics, and they broke it into fields, and then they had interdisciplinary things, and they had molecular biology, you know. Uh, you became a biochemist. And then I started thinking, well, gee, if all these guys could make up fields, maybe I could make up my own. That'd be a pretty cool idea. I thought, if I was going to make up a field, what would I want in it? And I thought, you know what I'd want? The ability to do whatever I wanted to. Because they kept saying I couldn't do things. I read all these psychology books that existed. I read everything under the sun. I went and looked at every psychologist who was supposed to be able to do anything, and most of them were major clowns. I mean, just quite frankly, they not only were not helpful, they were damaging the people they worked with. They, took the, they put them in prisons that were beyond description. They put electric bolts through their head. It was right out of Boris Korloff movies. And they, put, they gave them drugs that, that made it so that they didn't even stand a chance of becoming wiser. They put them on Thorazine. They should have, you know, they should have given them a few hits of acid and played the Grateful Dead. You know, they'd have been better off than giving them Thorazine for five years on electric shock treatment. You know, and then going, hmm. And it, was there no way out of it? Because, you see, they thought the object was to diagnose the illness that people had, because they even called it mental illness. Wrong from the get-go. The fact that people are weird was obvious. I grew up in San Francisco in the 60s. Everybody was weird. In fact, in the 50s, they were even weirder before they started getting strange. I can remember school teachers saying the stupidest things to me you could even imagine, looking at me with a straight face and saying things like, OK, Today we're going to learn to spell phonetically, and then writing P-H, and looking at it there and just thinking to myself, I was only in the second grade, and I knew you couldn't spell phonetics phonetically. But they're still doing it. Not everywhere, though, because in 35 years, for the first five years, I didn't call it NLP. I wouldn't name what I did, because I didn't want people joining. Um, you know, a lot of people have accused me of being a guru. I'm just not that fucking sociable. Excuse me. I go off and do stuff by myself, and I report back. That's the way I do things. Lots of people want to follow me, but they discover that's really difficult to do. For one reason, I don't sleep much, and I travel fast. Um, I went a lot of weird places to try and find things. I went to, I went to Harvard and looked at these intelligent scholars. And, or excuse me, I almost fell asleep. Uh, I went to Stanford, to Henry Hilgard's hypnosis labs, and where they were studying hypnosis. Uh, and they, had, they actually scientifically proved that people couldn't be hypnotized. And, uh, but of course, you know how they proved this? With tape recorders. They had people sit in a room, and they put a tape recorder in a chair next to them, and played a pre-taped induction, and looked through a window at them. Well, if the tape was any good, they could have sat in the room with them. But they didn't want to spoil the data. Oh, and they forgot, and you should have heard this tape. This was one of the worst hypnotic inductions I'd, I'd heard in my life. It was, they, number one, believed that voice tone and voice tempo and voice inflection have absolutely no impact on the hypnotic process and the changes in someone's voice in no way affect their consciousness whatsoever. So, they only spoke in a monotone. In fact, if you read hypnosis books from the 60s, they all say you must speak in a monotone voice. You tell people you are getting sleepy, sleepy, <laughs> sleepy. You are going down escalators. Down, 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 down the escalators. There you will find another escalator. And just keep going down the fucking escalators. 
Then you'll find an elevator and you'll go down in the elevator. And three and a half years later, you'll be broke. <laughs> They introduced me to one person who got a zero on Henry Hilgard's hypnotizability scale. And this woman, she was, she was a sweet old lady, she was about 45. And these two guys brought this woman in. And there was one on either one of her arms. They brought her in like this. And she was in a fucking deep trance. And they said that she is completely unhypnotizable. And I said, they said, isn't that true? And she went, yes. <laughs> and I said, wow. I said, cool. And I said, it's really nice to meet you. And I looked her in the eye and I began to breathe at the same rate she was breathing. Now, I'm I, unlike most of the hypnotists in the 60s, they were all, by the way, trying to hypnotize each other and not go into a trance. I don't know why. I have never figured this out. I went to the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, and they were all, they taught classes on how to not go into trance while working with clients. They were afraid to go into a trance. Because after all, if they went into a trance, they might have some fucking idea what was going on. But I took a different approach. I figured if it's good enough for the clients, the best way to put them in a trance was to show them where it was. That was my theory. I just looked at this woman and I looked her in the eye and I went, hello. <laughs> and I said, now, these people have told you you can't go into a trance deeply, that you can't relax, and that your consciousness won't change, and that you can't feel the power of what would happen if you just allowed yourself to let your other mind come forward. That's right. <laughs> Let's take a deep breath and fasten your seatbelt, dear. <laughs> you sit in the front row, it's bound to happen. <laughs> People sit in the front row and they go, why is he looking at me? Because you're fucking sitting right there, that's why. You don't want me to see you? Try hiding in the back. I won't notice you. Your unconscious will be sitting there. My unconscious will be sitting here. We won't, we won't be talking to each other privately. <laughs> I did things, I went with Virginia Satir, very nice lady, Virginia Satir, very, for her time, very innovative. She actually thought you should see the whole family if you had somebody who was crazy in it, see if you could figure out what's going on. She went to jail for that. It was illegal because psychiatrists were threatened by this. A social worker actually trying to do therapy on somebody. After all, how could they? They didn't have the proper licenses. And as I like to point out, <coughs> excuse me, but they had all the licenses under the sun and they couldn't fix one client. That's a bad track record, don't you think? And I would say to them, I'd say to two, three hundred psychiatrists at a time, and I'd say to them, psychologists, I'd say, okay, tell me one thing that some people could come in with and tell you what it is, and you know exactly what to do without giving them any medication. And I mean, whether it's six months, five years, that you know for a fact that you can do something about it and that the problem will be solved. And they would always go like this. They get this uncomfortable movement. They go, <coughs> well, uh, Mr. Vandler, that's not the way these things work. And I'd say, bullshit. I'll bet I can give you a phobia in two seconds. In fact, you're already headed towards anxiety. <laughs> Now, if people can develop a phobia in two seconds, why can't we get rid of one? You know, at least in half an hour. That was my first phobia thing, it was a half an hour. Then I got it down to 15 minutes. Now I can do it like that, 30 seconds. I can do it while, while they go to commercial, when I do interviews. I just did one in Mexico, and the producer said, well, we have somebody with a phobia. Do you want to take them in the back for, for an hour? And I went, no. I said, uh, they were interviewing me. I said, just bring them out on the stage. And he said, well, when we come back from commercial, there's only going to be two minutes. And I said, then find something to fill the rest of the time. <laughs> and he looked at me with terror in his eyes, and he goes, but what if it doesn't work? What if we bring in the snake and they're still frightened? And I said, uh, I said well, then I'll use the other minute. I said... <laughs> and he said, he went, he went, he went, people are watching me this show all over South America. And I said, yeah, and he said, are you willing to risk your reputation? And I said, I, said, I haven't got any reputation to risk. 
<laughs> my reputation is, is that goes like this. If you're a psychiatrist and I introduce myself first, you say you're a plumber. <laughs> Many have made the other mistake. I used to sit down on airplanes, pull out the magazine, start reading. Somebody would sit down next to me and open up their briefcase and pull out a copy of The Structure of Magic, begin reading it. And I'd love to look at them and go, oh, are you a magician? And they'd go, <clears throat> no. And I go, it says magic on it. And they go, well, it's not that kind of magic. And I go, cool. So what is it? And they go, I'm certain I'm, that you wouldn't understand this. It's far too complex. <laughs> and I go, I go, I go, watch this. I can make your ego disappear. Just like that. And they'd go, what? And I'd go, stewardess. They'd come over and they'd go, yes, Dr. Bandler. And they'd go, ah, 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 and their ego was gone. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Good trick, huh? I had, uh, I had one guy. I thought this was wonderful. I was in a hotel in uh, <coughs> Los Angeles, big fancy hotel. Went downstairs. <sighs> big sign up there, you know. American Psychological Association, national meeting. And I looked and they had stuff about abnormal personalities. And then it says, my work with Dr. Bandler. And there was some name I'd never fucking heard of. And I thought, cool. Well, you know, I took a lot of drugs when I was young. Maybe I missed something. <laughs> But I usually remember names and things like, you know, having worked with somebody for five or six years. But just to be safe, I went up and there was a woman sitting at this table. And I walked up and I said, I said, I said, I said, your hair looks really nice that way. And she went, do you think so? And I went and stole the name tag, stuck it on. Went into this meeting and sat in the front row. And uh, this guy came out, started talking. He didn't recognize me. I sure didn't recognize him. And he's telling uh, 500 people about how he got together and developed all this work and did all this stuff. And I'm staring at him like this. And I raised my hand, and he said, I'll take questions later. And I went, <laughs> and he said, what is it? And he looks down and he goes, Sue Parker? <laughs> I said, yep, that's me, Sue Parker. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, this all sounds interesting, but I heard with NLP that you could cure people of phobias. Is that right? Because I have a terrible phobia, and it's, it's overwhelming fear that floods through my body with and goes to every extremity, and suddenly it begins to whirl through my body. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and he said, well, I, I, I was, I was going to do a demonstration. I said, oh, thank you. I volunteered and went up on the stage. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, Sue is a very unusual name. And I said, what's unusual about it? Lots of people have the name Sue. And I was thinking about suing, so I couldn't have been that far off. <laughs> and he said, so, he said, so you, uh, you have a phobia? And I said, oh, terrible, absolutely. I said, I said, you know, I can't look at my face in a mirror. I can't make a picture of myself in my mind without having total fear. Fix me. <laughs> Now, since all the books had only said up to that point in time ways of getting people over phobias by having them make pictures of themselves, this guy was in deep shit. And I anchored it. <laughs> and as he began to think of what he was going to do, I kept leaning forward and firing that anchor off. Because I wanted him to remember this moment for the rest of his life. In fact, I wanted it to be most of the rest of his life. Because um, <laughs> as he sat there, uh, go, uh, 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 um, uh, he, said, he said, give me a minute. And I said, I'll give you years. I said, oh, by the way, I want to show you something. And I opened up my coat, and I had my suit made, and it said on the inside, Richard Bandler. <laughs> and he looked at it, and he went, is that a clothing line? And I went, <laughs> that's desperate, don't you think? A clothing line? But he needed a line of some kind, and it was like, you know, <laughs> what do we call it, a lifeline, that's it. That's where you call somebody and go, I don't know the answer to this one. But yet the answer is very simple. Because I discovered when I went into mental hospitals with Virginia, these horrible places, uh, that these people just weren't trying very hard. 
the scientific method had them, they were, they were studying catatonics, one of the hospitals. And you know how that's it's really cool, they put them all in the same place together. They had them in a room, they're very quiet, so they're not going to bother anyone. And they're all in there just hanging out. And, uh, and they even had nice quiet music playing in the background, la, 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 like that. And uh, <coughs> there was a sign on the door that said, quiet. As you walked in, it did. It was a big printed thing. Somebody had printed it up and posted it on the door, and it said, quiet. And, uh, and I'm just not the kind of person that does what I'm supposed to. Never have been. Uh, people have made up rules, and uh, some rules are good. Don't kill people, I think, is a pretty good rule. Uh, governments seem to have trouble following it. Uh, religious fanatics are the worst. You give somebody uh, a, a religious book, and they fail to read the thing. Uh, some, some of them just go wacky, especially when they're brought up in these things and they're told that it's okay to kill everybody who's not a member of our group. Um, doesn't count. You know, uh, being Jewish, I know all about it. That's the very first thing they did. They freed the Jews, took them over to where the Canaanites were. God came by and said, kill all these people and I'll give you their property. Um, I know a lot of people don't like that, my description of the story, but read the book, it's what it says. Um, I think the idea of, of creating more property is the real answer, that uh, we shouldn't just go to other stars, I think we should be able to make them. I think when we let our imaginations roll in that direction, we start looking at what's possible, you discover the simple solutions. Now, I saw, walked in this room and I looked around, and I, here are these people. I was getting a tour of the hospital. They even have a fancy name for it, they call it Grand Rounds. Uh, it really just means you walk around the hospital. Uh, and they tell you how sick people are. And they said, this is, uh, this is our ward for catatonics. And I said, cool. And I walked up and I, there was a guy there and I went, <laughs> flicked him in the end of the nose. <laughs> and the doctor freaked. He said, what are you doing? And I said, he said he was catatonic. I'm just checking. And uh, he said, well, he said, you know, we don't abuse our patients. And I said, I said leaving him in this room is an abuse? I said, how long has this guy been here? And he said, eh, three years. And he said, and he'll probably be here the rest of his life. And I said, want to bet? I'm a betting man, I'll always take a good bet. <laughs> and he said, uh, what do you mean? And I said, you don't know what a bet is? I said, think it over. And I walked over and there was a guy fixing a little vent. And I took a ball-peen hammer and I walked over and I took this guy's slipper off. He was in a wheelchair, put his foot on the floor, the linoleum, and I took the ball-peen hammer and I went, bang, and I hit this guy on the little toe. And I got news for you. <laughs> I, you guys have hit your thumb with a hammer. It hurts like a motherfucker. You know, this is, you know, you don't hit somebody on the toe and get no response. It just doesn't happen. Even the psychiatrist screamed. And it wasn't even his toe. And this guy just shake like this. And I lifted that fucking hammer up and hit the next toe, smiled up at him and went, and he went, now, now in those days I didn't know much about catatonics, but I have come to learn that when catatonics come out of that state, it requires massive amounts of adrenaline. And they usually do that by being very, very angry. So it's always good to have a spare psychiatrist around. Because uh, when this guy, this guy had a decatheter sticking up his penis, Right? an IV tube out of his arm, and this guy stood up and that decatheter popped out of his dick like you wouldn't believe. So he was pretty pissed off, I would say. Uh, he went, Aah! and I stepped back and I grabbed the psychiatrist and I shoved him up like this and I said, he made me do it! And this guy, who is, this guy who hasn't moved around much in three years, he's got bed sores all over him, as thin as a rail, suddenly changes like the Hulk. Right? He goes, Aah! like this and jumps on the psychiatrists. They go down on the linoleum and he begins banging him on the linoleum like that. And I stepped back and said, that's right, get that aggression out. <laughs> because I had been told the stupid thing that... <laughs> Guess it slipped by a little later in German, huh? <laughs> yeah, I've been told that, you know, your aggression built up inside of you and you had to release it. Now, if that was true, where I grew up, everybody should have been really mellow. Because we all grew up beating the crap out of each other every fucking day. We, sh we should have grown up, you know, and been like Zen meditators. And we were all still violent assholes. So I don't think that theory works. 
It's nice on paper, though. Release your aggression. Crap. And this psychiatrist got up and started running, and this catatonic barefoot man down the hallway running after him. And I like the nurse, because the nurse was the coolest one. She didn't even get up. She said she was sat at her desk, and as she went by, she went, Get back in your chair! <laughs> And he stopped and he looked at her and she went, get back down there in that chair. All right. And he went back and he sat down and I said, get out of that chair. And he looked at me and he looked at her and I lifted that hammer up and he got back up out of the chair. Now, <clears throat> I was informed uh, by the administration of the hospital that such things were just not done. And I looked at the head of the hospital and I pulled out that ball-peen hammer and I looked him straight in the eye and I said, say what? And he went, <laughs> and he went for that phone to call security, and I lifted up that fucking hammer, and you know, he didn't call security. I said, you know what? I said, do you say what I did was irresponsible? He's sitting in the other room, the catatonic now, talking to the doctor, consoling the doctor, who is upset because he pissed himself. And the catatonic that's been pissing out of a tube for three years is consoling him. And I'm looking at the irony of this thinking, maybe there's something wrong with what they're doing in this field. Something's not quite right. So I began to investigate. I said, somebody's got to know what's going on out here. So I went out and I went, to all, I went to the human concentration camp for people in the human potential movement called the Esalen Institute in California. They had people doing gestalt therapy and bioenergetics and every other weird fucking thing you could think of. They stripped them naked and put them in hot tubs and made them pretend like it made no difference. I'll tell you, boy, I walked into that place and I had a swimsuit and a Polaroid camera. Fucking those people realized they were naked just like that. It's a different attitude. They said, <clears throat> they said, you're making us uncomfortable. And I said, yeah, and I'm pretty good at it too, aren't I? They tried to tell me in encounter groups. They gave me lists of things about how to communicate effectively. One of them was, you couldn't ask questions. That was the first thing. It said, don't ask questions. And I raised my hands and I said, why not? And he said, well, because behind every question, there's a feeling. Just state the feeling. And I went, what feeling? He said, the feeling behind your question. And I said, what question? And he said, well, you said, why can't we ask questions? And I said, we can, and I have been. <laughs> and he started to get real nervous. Now, I didn't even know anchoring then, but I knew how to use it. <laughs> and I said, look, uh, I have an idea. Everybody else in here doesn't want to ask questions. They cannot ask questions. But I ask questions because I want to know things. It's called learning. And I looked at this guy and I said, and if you ever tell me I can't ask a question, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> That's the way we do things where I came from. I said, do you have any questions about that? <laughs> I said, you can ask all the questions you want. He said, why are you being this way? And I said, because I said, I don't let other people restrict my freedom. It's just that way. As soon as you start restricting people's freedom, they get stupid. Not only do they get stupid, sometimes they even get degrees. Um, in stupidity. For example, you'll love this, one of the most credentialed human beings I ever met in my life, head of a big fancy uh, Ivy League college, was supposed to be one of the most brilliant people. I'd read his book, it was this fucking thick, right? And I went out to lunch with this guy, and it was all about the history of consciousness and stuff. And I thought it was great. And he talked about how representational systems had developed, and one time there were sayers and oracles, and people began to look at statues and hear voices. I thought he was talking about the development of consciousness in human beings. I discovered at lunch, he actually thought the voices were coming from the statues. This is MIT I'm talking about, by the way. This guy is supposed to be one of the most brilliant people in this. And I said, I said, you're, you're joking with me. And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, so statues have voices? And he went, of course they do. And I went, do, 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 do. And this one's running around loose, running a department at MIT. And this poor guy that watched his family die in a fire is locked in a mental hospital. Something's wrong here. Now, the people who uh, uh, were going to put their little girl, one of the case histories in one of my books, there was a little girl, wasn't even my patient, actually. 
because I don't really have patients, I have only students. So far, I haven't found anybody that's mentally ill. Uh, been looking seriously for 35 years, I haven't met anybody who's mentally ill. Met a lot of people who are very stupid, uh, especially when I went to Washington, D.C. The place is filled with them. Uh, I went there uh, to an educational meeting, thousands of educators from all over the world. They asked me to keynote the conference. And I came out and I said, uh, in order to solve a problem, you have to admit that you have a problem. And I'm not talking about the fact that a lot of you are alcoholics. And you get up and say, I'm an alcoholic, I haven't had a drink in three years. Uh, that's the dumbest thing I can imagine. If you haven't had a drink in three years, you should say, I was an alcoholic. <laughs> and I haven't had a drink in three years. It's not grammatical to say it otherwise. It's dependent. And it's hypnotizing yourself into believing something not worth believing, that you can't overcome your difficulties. Right? In fact, if you can make them, you can not only not overcome them, you can have amnesia for them. I've taken people who smoked for 20 years, put them in a trance, and gave them amnesia for having ever smoked cigarettes. Period. Did nothing else. And then a week later, I get a call from their wife saying, well, I haven't smoked. They said, but they lie to me all the time. They won't admit they ever did. I showed them a picture of us on our wedding night smoking cigarettes, and he said, there's no cigarettes in the pictures. <laughs> and I said, well, stop asking them. And she said, well, I still smoke. And I said, well, why don't you quit too? And she said, well, I've tried to quit a hundred times. And I said, well, no, you haven't really tried, because you can't try to do anything until you decide that you're only going to do that. This stuff with people having problems, it all begins with, it's, it's psychology goes into your childhood to look for where you got busted. See, their theory is you was born, and then you was going along just fine, and something bad happened to you. Right, and you got broke it. And, but you didn't notice it right away. You had to wait and let it fester for like 20 years. And then it pops out as a phobia or a bad habit. And they told me, boy, they said, because I was doing good with clients, man. They were sending me all of these weird clients. I mean, people who were supposed to be suicidal, and it turned out they weren't even suicidal. I love this lady kept uh, going to bed at night. And then she would wake up in the ocean. And she didn't live near the ocean. It was an hour and a half away. No memory of having driven there. Her car would be up on the cliffs and she'd find herself in the ocean. They said she was suicidal. And, uh, but they couldn't figure out anything. They didn't know what to do. So her rich husband said, you scatters are a bunch of jerks. He said, there must be somebody out there. And they said, well, there's this one weird guy. And they always call on the phone. They go, you're my last hope. And I go, well, you're fucked then, aren't you? <laughs> but I took this woman and I put her into a deep trance. I asked her the irrelevant question. I said, are you trying to kill yourself? And she said, no. And I said, then how goes when you keep waking up in the ocean? And she said, because I'm trying to get away from my husband. <laughs> I said, it's not a very good approach. <laughs> if you go the other way, there's 3,000 miles and no water. <laughs> and she said, she doesn't know she wants to leave him. And I went, do, 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 do. It's The Exorcist. By the way, when they made that movie Jaws, I made a bundle off of that. You can't install phobias. There were people in Kansas who wouldn't take a bath. <laughs> it was wild. I did seminars on nothing but phobias. I'd have 3,000 people in a room, and I'd go, I'd, go, I'd just play the theme from Jaws. I'd go, do, 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 do. And everybody go, ah! And I'd go, okay, stop. Now make a picture of yourself doing something really stupid, being afraid when you don't need to. Only born with two natural fears. Just two. That's it, just two. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. Because your baby, those are probably the only two things you have to worry about. Uh, all the rest of them are learned. Babies, don't bite your fingernails. God, do you realize? Yeah, because uh, you know what? Don't argue with me either. That's more dangerous. <laughs> Get your fucking fingers out of your mouth. You know how many people wiped their ass and touched that door handle this morning? Yeah, yeah, I'm just picking at my lips, okay? But do it on your own time. Next time your hand goes up, I want you to go, oh, shit. Lots of people's shit. How do you deal with habits? But you use the truth. 
That's how you do it. How do you get people to change? You tell them the truth. And then you give them only the alternative of remaining the same and going into unbelievable pain and discomfort. For example, you can keep your bad habit, but I always add four or five more with it. Say, I say, all right, you want to keep smoking, that's fine, but you're going to be impotent until you quit. You'd be surprised how many guys change a habit right away. <laughs> Got anything else you want to pop up about? <laughs> See, I've discovered the trouble with psychologists and psychiatrists was they was a little too timid. They brought me in this mental hospital. This guy was in one of the day rooms. He was walking around, acting pretty weird. But of course, they gave him bad drugs to start with. You want people to be sane, don't give them bad drugs. Thorazine is never going to help anybody to get a firmer handle on reality. It's not going to teach you to be happy. It's an anti-happy drug. Elevil takes all the highs and all the lows away. If you want people to be happy, you get the drugs out of their system and give them something to be happy about. The first thing they have to do is to practice. Most of every single day, this is what I found out, all these years and all these clients, I found out everybody's practicing every day to see how bad they can feel. They spend most of every day, some of them even scare the crap out of themselves in the middle of the fucking night. They come in and they go, I have a nightmares. And I go, well, stop, stop it. And they go, well, I can't. And I go, yes, you can not stop it, or you could. It's up to you. It, it is your brain, isn't it? And they go, huh? And I go, hmm. you ever see that uh, show, The Secret Life of Dogs? And they put little cameras on dogs and found out what they did during the day when their owners were gone. It was really quite interesting. It is, and some of them went out of the house and went and visited all these people. And they, they, scientists did this. They consider that scientific. Uh, well, I did the same thing, only I did a thing called the secret life of brains. I wanted to know what your brains were doing when you weren't around. Because as it turns out, people are scaring the crap out of themselves. They can feel bad for no, absolutely no reason whatsoever. You, you can walk up to somebody and you go, okay. Uh, what are you doing here? And they go, well, uh, I've been really depressed. And you go, uh, do they pay you for that? So it's so always the first question I ask. I know it's not in the meta model, but I find it's more fun. Um, the meta model, by the way, was a model of what therapists did. Uh, that's why it has no end to it, because therapists never seem to get to the end. They, they didn't go after anything in particular, so they never seemed to get anywhere. People would come in and go, they're depressed, and they would go, uh, why are you depressed? And they go, well, I don't know, I just am. And they go, well, what depresses you? And then they get a long list. That sounds like fun, huh? But I'd go in and I'd go, uh, how do you know you're depressed? Maybe you're not, maybe you're really happy. And they go, no, I don't think so. And I go, uh, well, then if you know you're depressed, how do you know when to start? And they go, well, I wake up depressed. I go, you're lying. I go, let's do it this way. I'll get you in a state where you're not depressed, and then you find out what you have to do to get depressed again. And they go, well, lots of people have tried that. And I go, BOW! <laughs> and I go, okay, all right, now, what do you have to do to get depressed again? See, I'm an empirical scientist. I believe you have to take experience and find out where it takes you. And they go, well, uh, uh, and I go, see, now you're still scared. I said, now you could stay with the fear, we could go back to the depression, or we could explore the rest of the chemicals your brain is capable. Because you are capable of producing close to billions and billions of states of consciousness, and most people do like five. <laughs> they go, I'm afraid. They go inside and they start talking to themselves. And I, I, for the life of me, I can't even figure out about what or why they even bother, they go inside them. And then they make pictures of bad shit happening, it's not even happening, and they feel as if it is, and they feel bad. They're just so good at it, it's unbelievable. They come in and they go, well, I'm depressed. I go, how do you know when to be depressed? And they go, hmm, let's see. Um, mm, ah. Uh, now, where was the field of psychology? Excuse me. They claimed to be observant, and they missed accessing cues. I'm the guy that found that. 
okay? I got famous for that because psychologists actually now could see one thing. <laughs> Shows you what they were working with. See, they thought they had discovered something. When I went to one of these encounter groups, I walked in and I did like you did. I had my arms crossed, my legs crossed. And this guy said, says to me, he goes, it's okay, you can do it. Yeah, your ears are still going to fucking work. Um, <laughs> that's all I care about. <laughs> ears are open, brain will do what I tell it to. Most of the time it doesn't do what you want it to, so somebody has to be in charge. All you have to do is learn how it works. It'll do what you want it to. See, think about this. If you talk to yourself in bad tonality, you can feel bad any time of the day. Pretty cool, huh? All my clients would come in and they go, well, uh, I don't know, I just tell myself that life is not going to work out, that everything is horrible. And I go, uh, well, when you tell yourself that, I said, uh, where's the voice? And they go, it's in my head. And I go, where? Right, left, front, back? And they go, well, it's in the front. And I go, is it coming in or going out? They go, it's coming in. And I go, so it's right about what, here? I go, and I go up and I go, stop it! <laughs> Talk to yourself nice, and nice things will happen. Now, I know it sounds novel, but once people start talking to themselves nice and start making pictures of nice things, they start feeling better. Uh, they'd send me depressives, and I made them make pictures of having fun. <laughs> and most of them would go, I'd go, think of something fun, and they'd go, I can't. And I'd go, think of something fun or I'll hurt you. <laughs> and they go, you, you can't hit me, you're a doctor. And I go, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm a psychotic <laughs> with a sociopathic history and complete freedom. Not a good combination. I had a suicidal, they sent me this person, and this guy tried to kill himself six fucking times. I, I thought, I, and I, you know, that. I said, six times? I said, do you know why they sent me to me? I said, because I can get it done in three minutes. And I pulled out a Bowie knife this fucking big. I said, you ready? <laughs> and he went. And I, he said, goes, oh, wait, wait. And I said, I thought you wanted to die. I said, I got a big backyard and three shovels. He said, well, maybe, maybe if I did, uh, 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 I said, so maybe you want to think about it differently? Maybe there's something worth living for. You think so? And he went, yeah. And I threw the knife back in the drawer. I said, let's move on. I said, now, what can you make a picture of in your brain that can make you feel good? And he went, Phew. that was like getting out of my office, I think. <laughs> but you see, this guy had been taking drugs. First, he took street drugs. Then he went to a psychiatrist. Then he went to counseling, and they said, uh, and how do you feel about that? Translation, I had no fucking idea what to do. Uh, they were doing that all over the world, until Richard came along and busted him on it and said, look, if you want to help people, you have to teach them how to do what it is they need to do. If they're lethargic and they don't motivate themselves, then motivate them. You know, find some way of doing it. Uh, and how do you do that? You find people who know how to be motivated and you model their behavior and teach the other one to do it. People don't know how to be happy, you find happy people and teach the others. People who are schizophrenic only know how to do schizophrenia. So studying them for 10 years, they're the only ones that don't know. They brought me a great schizophrenic. She didn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. They told me that. Give me a file this fucking thick. You know what a file is? A list of things that won't work. Just that simple. So I took it and I went poof in the trash can. And the doctor looked at me and he goes, that's my only copy. And I said, then we're safe, aren't we? <laughs> now, I said, it's really simple. I said, uh, she doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality. So I told her, they had driven there in a the car. I said, fantasize coming here uh, in an airplane. Go to the airport, get on the plane, fly here, get out of there, rent a car, drive up. I said, did you do that? She said, yes. I said, how'd you get here? And she said, I flew. And I drove, I, I flew, I drove, and then she started crying. Uh, and I said to the psychiatrist, I said, how'd you get here? And he said, well, we drove. I said, how do you know that? And he said, because I'm a doctor. And I said, I didn't ask you why, I said, how? And he said, well, he said, I know the difference between fantasy and reality. I said, okay, now make a picture of going to the airport, getting, buying tickets, getting on the plane, buying here. 
I said, how did, how did you know uh, which one's the real picture? And he said, well, because fantasies have a black border around them. Schizophrenic looked at him and went, even I didn't know that. But then I don't care about the difference between reality and fantasy. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in getting rid of the black borders. <laughs> Changing reality. It's the easiest thing to change. If schizophrenics are not in touch with reality, hell with it. Change reality. That's the easiest thing of all to do. When people thought they were talking to Jesus Christ, 60 feet tall, I got some lasers and made me one. Then they weren't crazy anymore. The rest of the people in the hospital were a little nervous, though. <laughs> but you see, what we really need to do is teach people how to use their minds so that they can do things which are fun. But I tell you what I want to do. I want to take a little break here. Uh, we've been sitting here. I want to take uh, 20 minutes. You can have some water, some orange juice. And uh, so take 20 minutes, get a little air, meet me back here, and then we're going to try a few things with our brain and see if we can have a little fun ourselves. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, God, good. Uh, sir, will you grab that chair there and bring it up here? Um, now, I know some of you are probably saying to yourselves, I stopped abruptly, but I noticed that it was about 400 degrees in this room. So uh, I just went and had a, a little talk with management, and they're going to find a way of keeping the room cooler because they want to be able to have sex again sometime in their life. <laughs> <laughs> we also don't eat in class. That's the other big thing. No note-taking and no eating in class and keep, don't bite your fingernails and no scratching your nuts. That would be the one you'll regret the most. You'll reach down and I'll yell the word squeeze and that'll be it. Um, I choked a psychiatrist in a seminar one time. Uh, this guy uh, raised his hand and said, Dr. Bandler, I have a question. I'm a graduate of uh, one of the most prestigious universities in uh, uh, great Britain and I said excuse me what's so great about it <laughs> he didn't laugh he was too educated and uh, he said well <clears throat> I've worked with patients for years and and I went squeeze and he went bah! <laughs> and I said see it's that simple people respond and the trouble is, is if you don't teach them how to respond in a way that makes sense then they'll keep doing stupid things for example, I found out marriage counseling, they have people come in and sit and look at each other, bring up every bad fucking thing that ever happened, <laughs> and then get angry about it. I even went to a place where what they did is they'd, that, that each mention some bad thing and then whack each other with a styrofoam club with a wooden handle. It looked like a kendo class. A woman would come in and go, you made a pass at my best friend. Whack! And he'd go, you know, well, you never want to have sex with me. Whack! You know, and they'd do this for an hour to have a healthier marriage. Now, I'd say the problem was they were using the wrong hand of the thing. Because I said to the guy, I said, do you think this works? And he said, yeah, I wasn't married at the time. I've been married for 31 years now, but at the time I was just starting out. So I said, well, I'm not married. I said, but let me see if I can get this straight. I said, you pretend to be my bitch, okay? <laughs> and uh, he sat there. That's a female. Uh, so he looked very confused. What's a bitch? Um, uh, a bitch is not something that's bad. It's a female dog. And in his case, it was appropriate. So he sat there and I said, so now, what, if I say bring up something bad that happened, for example, you had me drive all the way out to this institute to teach me that I was going to learn something about how to get people to communicate better, and I'm very disappointed, and I took it the wooden end of the handle and whacked him in the forehead. And he went down, poof. And I have to admit, I did feel better. Um, but it's not gonna help people. Couples don't need to learn to fight. They already do an excellent job of that, as far as I can tell. That's not what they need. What they need is to be able to make it so that the habits they built up over the years disappear, unless they're good ones. Because after a while, they've done this anchoring thing, you know, it goes on, you know. It, it, uh, Husbands wait until their wife is in the worst possible mood, and then they, they, they look at her and they go, <sighs> and then pretty soon you can just go, <sighs> and she'll be in a bad mood for no reason. It's called the opera conditioning. Ring bell, dog salivates. Pavlov, name rings a bell, doesn't it? 
It is, you say Pavlov and psychotherapists salivate. <laughs> That's the difference between humans and dogs. Dogs make discretion. <laughs> they only salivate about food. But human beings can overgeneralize really easily. So what happens is, is people start learning things unnecessarily. And when you don't put controls on your own brain, it begins to do idiotic things. You begin to realize, for example, I know in a room this big that there's probably lots of you that make yourself feel bad most of the day about really nutty stuff. Some of it isn't even happening. What's that for? What? Oh. And that's in case somebody gets a bloody nose or... A <laughs> oh, if I get a sweaty brow, then we're going to punch a hole in the wall and get some air in here. I bring plastique just in case. Um, although in this country, it would be harder to get it in, I guess. They frowned on such things. Been too much of that already. You know, I've, just got, I've, I've been thinking about this Irish problem, and uh, I think if they just got rid of the border and the English, the problem would be solved. I, I mean, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but, uh, you know, didn't they kick uh, 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 the Iraqis out of Kuwait? Isn't that the solution? Wasn't their idea? And now they've kicked the Iraqis out of Iraqi. Um, I think that's pretty cool. Only President Bush, though. I like this. Our new Texas president. Uh, I, I like that. His, his thing. His, his, his Baghdad's not big enough for the two of us. <laughs> One of us is going to have to get out of town. Wanted dead or alive. They can't find this guy and his two sons. They haven't found Mulu Omar. This guy's a fat man with a big eye patch. You know, Bin Laden is seven foot tall, you know, and he's a heroin addict. Uh, oops, we're not supposed to know that. He has some health problems. Um, they, I saw they showed a picture of uh, where he was staying and they, quote, missed him. There was needles all over the floor and spoons with uh, burnt bottoms. I grew up in San Francisco. I can interpret what this means. Maybe the CIA can't figure it out, but let's see. The country that produces the largest amount of heroin, and there's spoons with burnt parts on the bottom, and hypodermic needles. Uh, what do you think they were doing? Uh, playing darts? <laughs> I, um, no, I, I, my theory is very simple. I think they found bin Laden and evaporated him, so they didn't have to do it. I'm not quite sure who did that, but... Uh, if it, I think if there's a, a benevolent God in the universe, he would do it more often. These dictators would come on TV, these wild people who want to start wars and stuff, and they'd get up and they'd go, and they'd just evaporate. Uh, Ronald Reagan wanted to set the system up. It's called Star Wars. <laughs> I, I worked for the government. I know we have lasers floating around in outer space that could evaporate things just like that. Great idea. Idi Amin, I thought he was dead, is still alive. I mean, excuse me, living in Saudi Arabia in a palace. He looted the treasury and went to Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, I think that, you know, this guy murdered millions of people. I think, you know, we should come up with something fun to do with him. I mean, I think maybe we should uh, let him go out into outer space, but right on the outside. <laughs> We should put seats on the outside of the space shuttle, have people check to make sure the tiles stay on. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I don't, I, I'm not big into politics. The only thing about politics that, that I didn't like is when they started telling me what I couldn't do. They started telling me, for example, they said I couldn't work with clients because I didn't have a license. This is why I made up the name Neurolinguistic Programming. I said, excuse me, I said, I'm not taking any case histories because uh, I don't care about their past. And I'm not going to fix any mental illness because I don't even believe in it. <clears throat> I said, all I'm going to do is educate people. I'm going to take this woman who can tell the difference between fantasies and reality, who is in a mental hospital for 15 years, ask her psychiatrist how he tells, and then teach her in a deep trance to put black borders around all of her fantasies. And she never had to go back to the mental hospital. And she's been free for 35 years. Walking around loose, happy, married, has children. Get this, she married the psychiatrist. <laughs> That's kind of a cute story, isn't it? I, I didn't intend that. I didn't, that was, I, oh yeah, he was in a trance too, wasn't he? Um, he drove her all the way out from Michigan. He really liked this woman, but she was crazy as a loon. 
and he knew she would ever leave the mental hospital. And he, he brought her and two other people out, drove them out, which and I think was a pretty courageous thing for a psychiatrist to do in the, the early 70s, bring three patients out of a mental hospital and drive across the United States. It's like 2,000 miles, you know, in the off chance that somebody could help them. And uh, the, other, the other two were actually not that crazy, I mean, as far as I could tell. Big deal, I mean, one of them talked to demons, you know. <laughs> no big deal, I can do that. <laughs> uh, you know, that's part, whole, part of the whole Jewish religion, that's what, that's what King Solomon did. He talked to demons, you know, he bound all these demons. I was, you know, it's, it's the history of the whole thing. Um, he got to be head of the country, these other people got locked up just for talking to demons. And, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but they just told the wrong person. They, they told a psychiatrist they talked to demons, and the psychiatrist, I guess, got nervous and put him in a mental hospital and kept telling him there were no demons. And they said, the demons came last night and talked about you, and he said, Thorazine. This guy had had 96 treatments of electric shock treatment. The skin on his face rippled from having that much electricity put through. Excuse me, that's not therapy. Uh, that's, uh, that's torture. Because uh, I asked the psychiatrist that brought him out, I said, I said, do you approve electric shock treatment? And he said, well, in some cases it's the only thing we know to do. And I said, well, so then uh, you don't think it's harmful to their health? And he said, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't think so. And so I cut the cord off the lamp in my office and stripped the wires on the end. And I said, hold on to these. Plugged it into the wall. He let go of the wires. That's cheating. I said, I thought it was dangerous. And he said, well, I'll get shocked. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, let's do it this way. And I plugged it back in and I took the two wires and I said, let's do a little therapy. Shall we? And he said, this is dangerous. And I said, yes, it is. Uh, do, any questions about that? And I said, if I find out that you're doing this, you know that they only outlawed giving electric shock treatment to patients against their will in California last year. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I think some people are due to have a calendar. I went through mental hospitals and pulled people out right and left, and they're having great lives and doing things. I mean, sure, maybe they're not like everybody else. You know, some of them you know, they were doing weird things. One guy was talking to the devil, and the uh, devil came to him up to his window, and he was on the third story in the mental hospital. Every night appeared to him and told him all this stuff. No problem. You can do it with lasers, a few lenses, smoke machine, a couple of amplifiers, and a reverb unit. No problem. Where do you get that devil from? Edmund Scientific Catalog, Barrington, New Jersey. Project that hologram into a little fog, right up there. Put a Marshall amps out there, a little reverb, put a microphone. Then you send a few people in. This was just after the movie The Exorcist came out, so I knew just what to do. I had a few guys that worked for me go and put some pneumatics in the drawers, made it so that he went and he laid down in his bed. We had a camera in there so we could tell what he was doing. It got dark, it got quiet. People scream in mental hospitals at night. There's always somebody going, ah! having nightmares or something. Very eerie place. And then all of a sudden, this guy's bed began to lift up off the floor and spin like this wildly. And the drawers began to open and close. And the bars blew off the front of his room. And he looked up, and there it was, 60 feet tall, a devil, red light coming through the fog. And this guy, this guy pissed himself big time. <laughs> and he didn't run over to the window, man. He, he went the other way. Surprise. But uh, suddenly these voices, we had martial amps on either side. And we went in, and you always have to have reverb to do religious figures. I don't know why, but it works better. <laughs> and we went to him, we went, Charlie! Right? <laughs> yes! He said, come to the window. I don't want to. He said, come to the window. <laughs> Charlie walks over to the window and here's a 60 foot figure. Um, by the way, when you do these kinds of things, you really should inform the people at the hospital. Um, <laughs> Because when I, I got done, I happened to pass the chapel in the hospital, and that motherfucker was full. Um, and I'd never seen anybody in it before. Um, and that was just the staff. Um, 
But uh, there was poor Charlie looking out of the window, and the devil had been torturing him for years. He'd been in the hospital 16 years. And uh, he, you know, and his wife is still married to him, a devoted woman, came and saw him every day after work. You know, his kids were growing up without him. I mean, I think that's a tragedy, a terrible tragedy. So I just thought he needed some proper motivation to want to go home. So uh, I, it wasn't, by the way, it wasn't really the devil talking to him. It was worse. It was me. Um, I said, Charlie, I've come to talk to you for the last time. Charlie looked at him and went, huh? And he said, I said this, I said, I said, you've been telling other people about our conversations, so you only have two choices. You will either do my work and my bidding, or I will suck you down into hell and skin you alive for centuries. Which will it be? You know, he didn't even think that one over. He chose right away. He went, I'll pick number one. And I had a light appear across the room. And I said, you will read and study my book. And then you will spread my word and you will never mention my name or that I exist to anyone ever again. You'll never make a picture of it in your mind. You'll never hear a voice. You will never have a dream about it. Or you know what will happen. I said, look, and there was a light shining down on this big, thick, giant book. And I said, go to the book. And he walked over like this. And there it was. And it said, sales training manual for life insurance. Charlie opened the book. And I said, read thy book. Learn thy work. <laughs> it went dark. Except for the light over the book. Charlie stayed up all night, read it cover to cover. The next day, three guys arrived from the insurance company, the mental hospital, and came in and did a job interview. We gave Charlie a suit and a tie, a briefcase, because you have to have such things, and uh, had him sit down and do a job interview. And these guys were so impressed, because I used their sales training manual. I'd done training at the company, and I said there was a guy, he was in a hospital, he'd been a little nervous, uh, and uh, He'd just been staying there for a couple of days. I didn't say 16 years. But after the job interview, all of the three executives came out and said, this guy knows more about our company than we do. He memorized every word in this book. He was their top salesman for 20 years. Highly motivated, one might say. <laughs> he went back with his family. He's a good grandparent. Um, doesn't ever talk about the devil, ever. Now, this is not the greatest cure in the world, but it's better than being in prison. Because to me, all these weird things, I know some of you have read Frogs into Princes, uh, or Richard's history of how to humiliate, humiliate psychologists. Because um, they sent me people they said couldn't be cured of the simplest stuff. People who were afraid to be on airplanes. I got paid a lot of money, rock star, couldn't fly on airplanes. Can't fly on airplanes, can't do concerts. Um, and, you know, this is 20 years ago. And uh, they, the doctors would sedate this guy. It's like he didn't take enough drugs as it was. They'd sedate this guy unconsciously and carry him onto a plane. And I was sitting in first class, airplane, and there's nobody else in first class. The whole first class is empty. And they bring this guy in on a stretcher. And they lay him across the seats, right? <laughs> and they strap it down, and this doctor sits down, and listens to his heart, and then these other five crazy lunatics come in and sit down and start ordering cocktails and going to the bathroom every five minutes, coming out looking like they just ate a powdered donut. And, uh, so, and I said to the psychiatrist, I said, I, said uh, I didn't know he was a shrink at the time, I said, I said is this guy going to live? I said, he's, just, he's always just sleeping, we just put him asleep so he could fly. He says, a phobia of flying. And I said, cool. Now, we haven't even left the airport yet, man. We're still sitting there. and People are coming on the plane, sitting so their luggage up in the back. All of a sudden, this guy's eyes open. And he goes ballistic. I mean, we're talking, the straps broke. He starts ripping the curtains off the windows, climbing across the seats, scratching at the walls. And this doctor pulls out another hypodermic needle and pulls it back. And this guy kicks it out of his hand and it 
darts across the room. I mean, this is right out of a movie, and I'm sitting here going, this is so cool. And the other guys in the band are all laughing, right? You know, and they're going, God, man, if you saw how many times we've been through this, right? And I said, I said, well, I said, what do you think it'd be worth you if, I, if you could just not have this problem anymore? And uh, he, said, he said, I'd pay you 50,000 bucks myself. I said, cool. And I walked over and I grabbed a hold of the guy and I said, look at me. And he started to wiggle and I looked him in the eye and I went like this. That's right. And I said, close your eyes. There you go. Now close them and leave them shut. That's right. There you go. <laughs> it's nothing to be nervous about. I'm just going to make you feel good. And when he closed his eyes, his eyes shut, I said, now, I want you to think about yourself being frightened of being in an airplane. See yourself there freaking out. Look at yourself until you see how stupid you look. And when you feel your, that it's, I want you to laugh at yourself. And he started laughing. And I said, don't you look like a complete fucking idiot? He laughed louder. And then I told him to think about the funniest thing he'd ever seen in his entire life. And when it's something that when he started to think about it, he'd look at a friend and they'd start laughing together and look at himself and start laughing and then see himself in the plane laughing. And he was laughing. And then I strapped him in the seat and he was still laughing. And I said, and every time you see anything related to an airplane, you'll either fall asleep or laugh. That's the only two interesting things to do on an airplane. And uh, they started the engines up and he started to get worried. And I said, silly, isn't it? I said, you can worry and be afraid or you can laugh or you can just go to sleep. That's what I do. I find it's the only thing to do on an airplane. Certainly not interested in the food. <laughs> you know, the chef puts his picture on the menu. And then <laughs> talk about, the, to me, I would never do that if I cook food like that. I mean, I've flown on every airline in the world, and excuse me, uh, I, I'd still go to, like, Pizza Hut and get a pizza. You're better off bringing it with you than some of these things. Because they always bring it out. You look at it, and you go, and this is, and they always go, well, it's chicken enchilada, uh, marsala, something, or it's a big fancy name. Uh, basically, I think it's chicken goop, um, put over lettuce with something that doesn't go with it. Just something so that you won't want to eat it quickly and won't ask for more, I believe is the theory. Um, <laughs> they're starting to get smart, give you something like a sandwich. That makes sense, you know, why they always went through this trouble. It was the era of TV dinners. They got carried away on airplanes with it. But anyway, suddenly I told this guy to open his eyes, and when he did, he looked around, and he was kind of laughing, and his friends were laughing. And uh, the psychiatrist was sitting uh, behind me. I didn't know he was a psychiatrist, but he was asleep. Um, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> he looked over, and he said, uh, he said uh, I'm not frightened. And I said, uh, no, and you won't be ever again. See, uh, by the way, uh, I, I'm a little dysentery. I've, I was in one of these unsanitary countries just before I came here. Uh, I was in London. And <laughs> this hotel I was staying at uh, tried to poison me before I left. But uh, somebody in the bathroom was uh, telling his friend exactly what I was doing this morning. It was quite interesting. Uh, you should check who's in a bathroom before you open your mouth. Uh, anyway, he, he was trying to explain. He was pretty accurate. He said that, why, was he tell why is Richard telling us these stories? because I'm trying to get your unconscious to know something before you do. Because I discovered when you get people to consciously look at their difficulties, they go around and they feel bad. Right. If you take somebody who has stage fright, is there anybody in here that's afraid to get up in front of an audience? <laughs> I love these unconscious cues. <laughs> Now, how many of there has to be, statistically, there has to be at least eight of you in this room. One of you severely. And it's okay, just, yeah, just raise your hands. I'm not going to make you come up here till, for at least five minutes. Um, 
see, Sophie, Sophie, you're sitting in the front row. If you came on the stage and turned around and talked to these people, you would be frightened? A little bit. That's not phobic. The guy sitting in the back is phobic. <laughs> All I had to do is said, come up on the stage. I didn't even say him. And he had sweat beads jump all the way to the stage. He had a voice inside his head that would make The Exorcist look like a comedy. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, making, he, saw, he saw himself coming up and trembling. He made all these pictures in his head. I saw it all, say. I've seen this stuff go on for years. I've learned to tune into this stuff. You can hide nothing from me now. And I'm not even interested. <laughs> That's the worst part of it. So if you came up here, sir, you'd be frightened? It would scare the crap out of you, wouldn't it? You're already scaring yourself, and you're not even coming up here. Now, that's because he's good at it. That's not because when he was five years old, he wanted to fuck his mother. Okay? That's Sigmund Freud's theory. That's why his name is Sick Man Fraud. Um, I read the books. I can't even fucking believe that that's serious. You know, they call me a quack? Excuse me! <laughs> Why, why do guys have problems? Because they wanted to fuck their mother when they were a baby? Oh, you know how many babies are laying around the crib going, man, I like to nail that bitch, you know? <laughs> how can they be this fucking stupid? Oh, uh, well, you see, Dr. Vandler, we don't, there is no such thing as hypnosis. You know, they told me this for years. And I went, there's no such thing as hypnosis. And I said, oh, okay, then you won't mind if I do it. And they said, well, hypnosis only treats the symptom. Well, first it doesn't exist, then it only treats the symptom. And I went, great! So if I, if I hypnotize this guy and he wasn't afraid anymore, that's a good thing, isn't it? Oh, no, <laughs> wrong, you're all wrong. If you suppress the symptom, it comes out somewhere else. And now I'm a mathematician. You should never tell this to a mathematician. We love that. You know, you take this part of the equation and change it, this part changes over here. When they told me that, I went, wow, that's great. And they went, no, no, that's bad. And I went, no, that's great. I said, think about it, hysterical paralysis, right? Hey, you hypnotize them, the leg works fine, plus they get the best directions of anybody on the planet. <laughs> Symptom conversion. And they go, no, 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 it has to come out somewhere bad. And I go, where is this written? I've read every religious text, all the physics books. I've read, uh, I, I read the book of the bee in Assyrian. And nowhere does it say that if you suppress a symptom, it has to come out somewhere bad. Even original sin isn't very original. I mean, think about it. All these religions, and they all have the same original sin, and it's the same one. When are they going to come up with a new one? I mean, excuse me, Bill Clinton. I mean, I'm so glad he's not president anymore. I was getting really tired of that stuff. Having a president come up and say, try to convince the American public, let alone the rest of the world, that oral sex is not sex. I wrote him a letter and said, obviously, Bill, you're not doing it right. Because when I do oral sex, it's sex. <laughs> Excuse me. Someone should know that. You know, I mean, <clears throat> and if Hillary didn't think it was uh, a problem, that explains a lot too. Uh, I can certainly see her in black leather boots with a whip. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> she wants to be president now too. She wants to be the first president. In fact, she wants to be the first god of planet Earth. Um, you see me, I don't want to run other people's lives. Uh, what's your name, sir? Michael? So, uh, Michael, uh, let me ask you, how long, how long have you been afraid? Have you always been afraid to get up in front of groups of people? Pardon? Yeah, as far as you remember. So, uh, so when uh, you were born, uh, there was a whole group of people there, and you, just, you, were t you said to yourself, I'm not going out there. It's nice, dark, quiet in here. I got lots of food. You know, I'm not going out there. I don't care what anybody says. And if they expect me to speak, I'm not saying nothing. And he came out and they slapped him on the ass and he went, oh. So they hit him again. Right. Then when he was in school, the teachers did things like him. They said to Michael, uh, we want you to come up on the blackboard now. 
and add these numbers together. Because after all, God will punish you if you don't do this right. I love this. God is all loving. And then they give you a list of how you'll be punished. Isn't that a great thing? I love these religions. I think they're a wonderful thing. It provides me with lots of work. I'll tell you. But if you actually read the books, the books have great stuff in them. You know, remember, uh, you know, Jewish people, we understand that this, is a, this book was written by Jews, for Jews. They mistranslated a few things. By the way, in the uh, Catholic Bible, it says, in the beginning, the word and the shadow moved across the deep. It's all very poetic and stuff. In the Hebrew one, it says, God farted. God passed wind. It's the Big Bang theory of the universe in a slightly different version. I sort of like the Zohar. The Zohar said, in the beginning, everything was light. Not darkness. <laughs> it was all light. But it had nothing to shine on. So it sucked itself into a single point and it, there was, and it went boom because there wasn't enough space for all the light to be in one place. So you have lots of renditions. And the coolest thing about religion is no one should argue about it or fight over it or kill each other because we all get to find out the answer when you're dead. So my theory is we should wait. Because <laughs> oh, people say, well, you know, people have asked me this. Uh, they, they, uh, when I was in London, I was staying in Mayfair and uh, I had this... Uh, Get contacted by a representative from one of the consulates there and they said Dr. Bandler uh, uh, we understand that you're Jewish and I said yeah I said but I don't practice and he said yeah. he, I said you don't and I said no I said I have it right now <laughs> I said I, I said I've never even been in a synagogue you know it was just my grandmother was Jewish and her family escaped from Germany uh, got away from the Nazis every other relative I had was killed concentration camp and she uh, snuck into Portugal and got on a freighter, uh, went to the United States, went to a place in New Jersey, and went inside a building and never came out, ever, till the day she died. Uh, so she wasn't really going to take anybody to a synagogue or anything like that. She, she left me a letter after she was dead uh, saying that we were Jewish. It wasn't like you wouldn't notice. I mean, there was Jewish stuff all over the place. Didn't make any difference to me. Um, it wasn't like they lied and said, you're a Catholic. You're a nice Irish Catholic boy. <laughs> uh, I want to be one of the first Irish Catholic uh, <clears throat> rabbis to perform a Muslim wedding. <laughs> See, I set goals that uh, are as difficult as possible. And I think I'll probably do it. Probably in the next month or two. Because to me... The idea of getting beyond the boundaries of some things is you find out that the answers are simple. As soon as somebody started to put black borders around their fantasies, then they weren't crazy anymore. Then they could have their life. Here's this guy. Now, how do you, how do you scare yourself, Michael? What do you do? You make some big bad pictures? You make pictures of things? So if I did say that, I'm going to ask you to come up here. What do you do in your head? Woo, that's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> Yeah, so you guys can't see the pictures, but they're great. Mine are just reversed because I'm on the other side. Um, but anyway, so, so you, he sees audiences staring at him. You, you see a sea of people and yourself there being nervous? Good guess, huh? And then he has a voice and he hears in his head that sounds of... Frightened, right? You don't sound like you're really enjoying yourself on that stage, do you, Michael? No. But you know what? You look like the kind of guy that's had some fun in your life, haven't you? From time to time. Yeah, not not on a stage, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, you pulled a few pints in your life, have you? <laughs> why I love this country. There's always a reference point for fun in this country. <laughs> you, you say the magic anchor word, pub. <laughs> as soon as you say it, either that or you can just hum a few bars of a couple of tunes in this country. Other countries, you have to really talk to people. Some countries are so fucking serious, you just want to beat the shit out of them. First 10 years I worked in London, I couldn't believe how much trouble it was to get a good feeling out of somebody. I'd say, think of a time you were really having fun. And they'd go, oh. 
Well, there was a time, uh, maybe 20 years ago, I, I, was, I was in the desert um, with a friend of mine. I said, I don't want the story, just think about it. And they I guess I go, you're not smiling. And they go, well, we were under fire. And I'm going, <laughs> I go, that's like the best time? I said, I said, you haven't ever just laughed at a joke or something simple? I'm not like, looking for big things, but you've had good times. Close your eyes for a minute and, and, and think of something you've done where you really enjoyed yourself, really had fun. Okay, can you see what you saw when you were actually there? Hear what you heard? All right, double the size of the picture. That's right, turn the brightness up. And feel the feeling pouring into your body from your memory. Where does it start, Michael? Michael, try to pay attention here. <laughs> so when you got in that memory, you no, oh, man, this feels a lot fucking better than that fear. <laughs> fucking fear stuff scares the crap out of me, you know? That's the way I feel about it. Um, I, oh, by the way, a new study came out uh, just six months ago, uh, and they uh, have re-verified the results, that with just six years of desensitization, they can guarantee you that they can reduce your anxiety by at least 10%. <laughs> and how they measure that, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I have a better idea. When, I, when you started to think about the good feeling, and uh, where did it come from? No, no, in your body. Did you feel it in your, in your foot first? No, right here, okay. And then the more you thought about it, where did it go? It, I like the way it went, it went up further. <laughs> Don't scare me, Michael. <laughs> Remember, I know all those demons. <laughs> no, let, close your eyes, go back and think about the good experience. But before you do, th there's just a couple ways this can go. When you think about good feelings, right, they would just disappear unless you can get them to move. Because nerves, if you keep touching them, uh, they habituate and they won't, make it, they won't do anything. So what happens is, it's like the fear, if you think about coming up here, right, the fear, where does that, where does that start? Nice thing about fear is it doesn't take any time at all. People don't have to work themselves up into fear. You know, they, I mean, it's not, it's not like they go, hey, Michael, come up here. He doesn't go, give me an hour. You know, it's like just right there, just like that. And so where does the fear start? Right? Throat? Right. Okay. And, and see, so you have your good feelings start in one place and your bad feelings start in another place. Right? Now, when you stop thinking about coming up here, your fear went away. So first it builds in your throat, but once it builds up, it, it would just stop unless you spin it around this way, or this way, or this way, or that way. So think about coming up here, turning around, looking at the audience, and uh, saying good morning and talking to them, and double the size of that picture and feel which way does the fear move. Close your eyes. Do, 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 do. Right. Which way does it spin? Just show me with your finger. It goes like this. Okay, now the good feeling, right, when you was partying and having fun, that's much more to my liking, see? See, to me, this is, this is I'm, I'm here to enjoy myself, and your unconscious will do the same or else. <laughs> when you dream tonight, <laughs> you'll have a new experience. <laughs> you'll be visited. <laughs> You'll be talking to a priest tomorrow for fucking hours. <laughs> and he'll close the door on that little booth. <laughs> I go into every once in a while to a confessional just to see if I can scare the crap out of him. I go in, I go, Father, forgive me. for I was comporting with the devil. I said, a demon came and spoke to me last night. It came in the form of a woman. Then I get real descriptive. I've had them say, you don't need to go into such detail. And I go, no, 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 I don't mind. <laughs> I, I, I want to get, get it all out there. So let me get back to where I was. So, when the, and the good feeling, okay, when you think about the time you were enjoying yourself, close your eyes, right? Oh, by the way, when you think about the one that scares you, where's the picture? Point to it. Take your finger and point. It's right there. 
and the one you enjoy, where's that? So they're not in the same place. So as a rule, by the way, Michael, uh, when you look at pictures that are here, don't. <laughs> the ones over here, probably a lot better. Okay, now, uh, the, when you look at the one that you enjoy, okay, take a look at it, which way? Does the feelings move in the same direction like this, or do they move in a different direction? I realize it's technical stuff, but it saves you years of fucking therapy. <laughs> and then you have to talk about your penis and all that stuff. <laughs> Show me with your finger. Which way does it move? When you think about it, because you're enjoying yourself, okay? Okay, you get the feeling starts here, right? And then does it go this way or that way? Oh, it goes this way? Whee! So it goes around like that. Cool. All right. Let's get weird. Okay? Psychiatrists would then, they would ask you questions like this. They'd go, Sir Michael, tell me about your mother. <laughs> what perverts these guys are. Um, and then when you would matter what you'd say, Oh, my mother's a lovely woman. They would go, Ah. <laughs> and you'd go, What? And they'd go, Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You go, what are you writing down? You go, I'll tell you in five years. That's called psychoanalysis. Uh, <laughs> psychoanalysis is such a nutty idea. You free associate for five years, an hour a day, four days a week, and then I'll tell you why you're fucked up and it'll disappear magically. Theory, insight produces change. So if you know why you're fucked up, you won't be fucked up. This has been tested now for years and years and years, and guess what? It doesn't work. People who know why they're fucked up are still fucked up. <laughs> Works for all of us, doesn't it? Poor Michael knows he is afraid to get on stage. He may know why it started. He may know everything about it, but it doesn't change the fact that it still happens. It happens because your brain's neurology is put together physically in a certain way. Neurons always go to the next one in size. And every night while you sleep and while you dream, you grow billions of neurocortical pathways based on your experience. You probably did trillions when you were children. That's why children dream so much. All rapid eye movement. And I found out the giddiest thing. If you can reverse it, once you run a neural pathway backwards, it won't run forwards anymore. So you can actually get any behavior that bothers you to stop just like this. And if you're really good, you can put a new one in, oh, in like five minutes. It's called learning. It's called thinking. So Michael, try something. You know the bad feeling? Okay. Okay. You know where it is. So you know it starts in your throat. Okay. And you know that it moves this way, right? Okay. What I want you to do is keep the same picture in your mind, but I want you to, wait, not, don't, not yet. I'll tell you when. And I want you to push it outside of you. I want you to turn it upside down so that it spins in the opposite direction and pull it back in your throat so that it spins backwards. Do you understand? Okay, close your eyes. All right, here's it. So Richard goes, come on up here, Michael. You go, ah! Okay, the bad feeling starts spinning, right? Pull it outside of you, flip it upside down. Now it's spinning in the opposite direction and pull it inside. So it'll be moving physically in the opposite direction. Only difference is it won't feel bad anymore. You're still seeing the same things and keep it spinning. Spin it faster. If you like this feeling better, shake your head yes. Yeah. All right. Then spin, spin the hell out of it then. Don't screw it. Keep spinning it. Let it fill your whole body. Double the width of it. Spin it. And yet you're still seeing the same things. Right. Then if you want to get real tricky, Make it so that the voice inside your head sounds like it's having as much fun as the feeling. So you say to yourself, maybe I will get on that stage, right? And keep that thing spinning in the new direction, spin it even faster and faster still. And they make images of going up and enjoying yourself and telling stories and realizing that you can get rich, you can get late, you can get anything and spin the feeling even faster still. I refer to this, by the way, as brief earth therapy. Now, as long as you keep this feeling spinning, my guess is 
Come on, you can spin it faster than that. Put a little effort into it. By the way, there is a side effect of doing this. Your orgasms will last four times as long <laughs> and be 25 times more intense. And it does have a tendency to quadruple your income in half the time. But other than that, there is no real danger. So you just spin that as fast as you can, Michael. Keep it in mind, okay? Now, keep it spinning in your body, and, but open your eyes and keep the feeling spinning. Open your eyes and look at me. Look me I am. Keep the, you got the feeling spinning in the new direction? All right, keep it spinning. Now stand up. Keep it spinning. All right, keep it spinning. Got it spinning? Walk out into the aisle. Keep it spinning in the new direction. That's right. Spin it faster. Come on, keep it spinning in the new direction. And then just walk up here. That's right, keep it spinning in the new direction. Cool, just come on up here, sit down. Keep it spinning in the new direction. Turn around, look at all these people. All right, feels pretty good, doesn't it? Cool, huh? Now, your choice is to feel this good or to go to therapy for the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> but it's up to you, you get to choose. All right, now, what I want you to do is to realize is that everything you start to do from this point forward, the feeling becomes even better. So if you just say hello, you get that same good feeling, keep the feeling spinning now, and as soon as you say hello, I want it to double intensity. Oh. <laughs> cool, huh? <laughs> so that, so, so, so wh where, where, do you, where, where are you from? Cotton cork. I've heard about corks before. <laughs> no, actually, I, I said one of the cities in Ireland I haven't been to yet. I keep hearing about it. But I've, I've been to lots of them, but for some reason I just haven't gone there yet. I, it's, uh, I only got half the map of Ireland. Um, and somebody else got the other half. There was only one left at the rental car agency, so we split it in half. And I've, I've been here for years and I've never managed to get another one. So. I'm telling you total bullshit, don't listen to me. <laughs> I'm just actually, uh, I was waiting to see you. So are you going to go back and be afraid again? Let's, 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 you could do it, you could do it. I said, well, that's what they say, isn't it? They say the symptoms are bound to come back, so why fuck around, why wait? Uh, go ahead, be afraid. <laughs> you can't even do it, can you? <laughs> Not as well as you could. Well, you see, this is just the beginning, but see, now we can do a trick. Oh, did they tell you I was a hypnotist? I heard that. Yeah, you heard that there too. I got a letter, by the way, uh, uh, after Milton died, telling me that I was uh, confirmed as being the best living hypnotist on the face of the earth. And I didn't know that there were dead hypnotists on the earth <laughs> still practicing, but... I guess that, you know, they come in the form of ghosts, they go, look at my watch and chain. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I, there is something I want to caution you all about. You've gone through your whole life and people have given you bad suggestions. It's probably how Michael ended up being afraid of this, is that some teachers scared the piss out of him in school. He was daydreaming or something and they went, Michael, get up here, and he went, ah! And so he took his fear and attached it to that. Now that you know why, you can, you're cured to be healed, my child. Um, we could do it that, you know, I used to, I used to use uh, water from Lourdes as a way of curing people. Uh, and I didn't even know where Lourdes was. I got mine from the tap. Um, hey, now that I found out where it was, I found out you can buy Lourdes water online. Is that not the coolest thing? There, there's a whole list of websites of holy water places where, where they'll send you water. You can get one from Mexico and all these different places. It's, it's great. There's a, a website where you can actually order uh, instructions from a witch doctor in Africa. And, they, and you, you go on the line and you answer certain questions and they send you little voodoo dolls with certain herbs in it. You wear it around your neck and it wards off evil and stuff like that. Um, however, my mother-in-law still visits, that doesn't seem to work that well. <clears throat> I, but when I told her what it was, she didn't come back anymore, that was cool. Uh, so I, got, I went back online and I told the witch doctor, it worked. You, have, you can now have a quote from Richard Bandler, 
order voodoo. Well, I modeled voodoo. You think I wouldn't model voodoo? I modeled Milton Erickson. Think I wouldn't look at voodoo? You should be crazy. I've modeled everything to find out. And there's some serious stuff these guys know how to do. That's why when you go to these uh, meetings for religious things, when gurus and stuff, Richard has one suggestion. Don't drink the tea. Okay? <laughs> I worked with the deprogrammers. I, I'm the guy that helped the deprogrammers to set up all the deprogramming thing to get, get people out of these cults and stuff where they went nuts. We found out they were drugging people. Everybody would sit around and drink a little tea and then the guru would talk to them and next thing they knew they were at the airport with incense with a bald head and their penis cut off. Um, that, that falls in the bad decision category. But let me tell you, uh, if you were to go into a deep trance, uh, you know what you could do? No idea. One of the things you could do, because you have a lifetime of being afraid of something, and uh, you could actually not worry about it. Because, uh, you know, if suddenly you don't have a fear that you had, and you go back to your life, uh, uh, people get suspicious. And they start giving you bad suggestions, especially if they're highly trained professionals like psychologists. So, well, well, yeah, that sort of thing will work, but suddenly the fear will come and strike you from the nowhere. And, uh, and if that suggestion were to get in your head, then it could come back. And I'd rather you had good suggestions so that you always have to warn people. So that if you go back and your fear is gone and, and people say to you, well, what happened? Say, God came to me and said it was okay. Because that'll keep their mouth shut. They won't be saying anything about it then. I find this, I, I, I had a guy who had a phobia of driving and uh, I fixed him and, uh, and they, they did an exorcism at his church. <laughs> they said that I put a demon inside him driving and they went in and it, it scared the crap out of him and his fear came back. And he called, he called him on the phone and said, you know, that they had done the three days they kept him tied to the fucking floor. It's one of these American wacko churches, you know, the holy church of the revised bleeding mother virgin of Jesus Christ of the give me all your money fund. Um, so I decided I had to visit this church. <laughs> Armed. Well, but not with what you would normally think. Physicists have much better toys uh, than you could ever imagine. Uh, we build things. We love to build things. And I used to work for an agency that shall remain unnamed but it only has three letters. Um, and we built things like a positive negative ion gun, coolest thing in the world. Charges any metal object up to 5,000 volts, bang, just like that, from a distance of up to 100 yards, including zippers. Just think of the possibilities. So Richard walks into this church, sits, sits down and says, you did a bad thing to my client, you will be punished. And he said, we're protected by Jesus. And I went, Pfft. and that minister's zipper went up to 5,000 volts. <laughs> and when he tore his pants off in front of that congregation, hopping up and down on one foot, who do you think was closer to God? The physicist or the preacher? <laughs> Jesus didn't protect him. Jesus was around. Well, actually, he's dead, I heard. Um, and I think it's a symbol of peace. Having a dead Jew on a stick is probably not a good idea. And I know other religions think this is fine, but as a Jew, I, it makes me nervous. I think we should all take turns. Put a Catholic up there for four weeks and a Muslim for four weeks. Or maybe just political guys, like we could put Ronald Reagan up there. He wouldn't even notice. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. He got shot and didn't notice it. <laughs> now, I would say that falls in the category of not really being in touch with yourself. Uh, you know, because they, they told me in the 60s, it's, oh, get in touch with yourself. And I went, okay, <laughs> I'm there. And they said, no, no, your inner feelings. Excuse me, I don't do stuff like that. Inner feelings, they said. Well, if you're going to have inner feelings, I think they should be good ones. So I wouldn't put you into a deep trance without your permission. Uh, but if I were to put you in a deep trance, I, what I would do is I'd do something like lift up your hand. And I'd say in a minute, I'm going to turn over and I'm going to say to you something, a simple word. And when I say that word, suddenly you're going to drop into a deep state. The word is simple. It's sleep. Close your eyes now. That's right. Close your eyes. It's all right. Let your unconscious come forward. Spin that good feeling and spin it faster. 
And any time anybody tries to take that away from you, it's going to double and it's going to triple. That's right, quadruple it, bang, spin it up faster. And I want you to see yourself being in places, being able to talk and feeling fine. That's right. Let your unconscious do it. You want your unconscious to keep your heart beating. You want your unconscious to make the good feeling come up automatically. In fact, there's a lot of times you're not feeling good when you really could. You need to let your imagination fucking run away with you, Michael. Think of all the other times you're feeling bad that it's really a fucking waste of time. You could actually start to really laugh about it if you think about it. Have you ever saw something so silly you just couldn't stop fucking giggling? You know what I mean? It's just totally ridiculous. Think about it. There are people who talk down to you. you know, kind of people talk down to you. Right? Next time they talk down to you, instead of feeling bad, I want you to feel how funny it is. You'll be surprised how they'll stop talking down to you. Think about other situations where you get nervous. You know all these places you could get nervous. Didn't you? And suddenly the feeling spins in the other direction and bang, bang, doubles and doubles and doubles again and spins faster and faster and faster and you begin to build what's called freedom. Because that's what all my work is about. Because freedom is everything. The freedom to feel good when you want to. The freedom to realize it's not through struggling but through relaxing that you learn. Now in a moment I want you to feel a pull between your hand and your nose. Feel this finger right here pulling towards your nose like there's a rubber band there. And the closer it gets, the more your unconscious is just signaling me that these learnings are going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Here we go now. It's getting stronger, pulling up towards your face, getting closer and closer and closer. And when it touches your nose, you're going to feel this wonderful feeling flood through your body. And each time you start to feel bad, it's going to spin in the opposite direction. Life is going to get wonderful. <laughs> there we go. Now. Yeah. Yeah. That's something else that comes from Texas. <laughs> I believe it's descriptive. That's right. Now I'm going to put your hand down and I want you to just relax. And I want you in your mind to see yourself doing things, your own life, doing them differently. Speaking up when you got something to say. Maybe there's some other times you don't ask for things that you want. Let your imagination run away with you. And I mean with your family, with your children, with your relatives, with your neighbors, with everybody. You shouldn't have to live in fear ever. We live in a society where phobias should be gone. Thirty years ago I figured out how to get rid of them. This is even faster. I mean, excuse me, you know how many people are sitting in a room right now talking about how they're afraid of some fucking stupid thing? I got paid 50,000 bucks for doing the rock musician. You know how many people are afraid to get on fucking airplanes? You guys can make this seminar pay for itself if you think about it. You know, charge by the change. See, I don't charge by the fucking hour. I don't want to spend an hour with anybody. <laughs> excuse me, huh? You know, what would I do with the rest of the time? You know? Tell jokes, that's what I usually do. Oh, and I get their unconscious to do things without knowing about it. Because once you realize about unconscious communication, see, parents do things like they say, well, when you grow up, we don't want you to be afraid. But if you tell people, don't think of blue, what happens? Don't think of red. Now don't think of purple. They tell people on their wedding night, they say, well, don't be, 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 be nervous. You know, it's only going to hurt for the rest of your life. <laughs> then they told me, you see, some of us are polarity responders. We get everything backwards. They told me when I got married, because I was a late bloomer, I didn't want to get married. I wanted to date everyone on the earth first. And uh, I did a pretty good job of it because I wanted to find the right person. And I kept going out with people that I thought were going to be the right person. And then it turned out I was really wrong. I'd see sometimes a woman and I'd go, God, I really want to meet her. And I'd walk up and I'd say hello and she'd turn around and go, what do you want? And I'd go, that's the wrong one. <laughs> you know, some guys are afraid of rejection. It's the best thing in the world, man. If a woman rejects you, just imagine you could have been married to her for 50 fucking years. <laughs> and putting up with that crap every moment of your life. You know, 
So if I walk up to a woman and say hello and she says, get the fuck away from me, you go, oh, excuse me, I thought you were someone else. In fact, I thought you were a whole other species. Um, <laughs> that's right, I just go back to hell and have a good time. Now, Michael, in a few moments I'm gonna count to three and when I do, I want this good feeling to spin like a lightning bolt inside you. I want you to stand up and I want you to look at these people and realize you never have to be afraid again. Say goodbye and go sit in your chair. You ready? One, two, three. Stand up. Say goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> so where's that guy in the bathroom that says I never work with people one-on-one? -on -one? Well, I don't. I usually do 400 at a time because I don't find it's any difference. While I was doing him, I already did to others of you that I'm going to, you'll come up here and you'll be easy demonstrations, but you've already been done. Because when you're not looking, I'll be there. <laughs> you see, the truth is, we all do this all the time. We're constantly programming each other. We're constantly programming yourself. I work with a lot of athletes that will do really well, and all of a sudden they start doing totally shitty. Doesn't make any sense at all. One uh, uh, American baseball player, he's a pitcher. Uh, this guy had a great season. He's doing absolutely wonderful. Right? Guy's making $30 million a year. And all of a sudden, he can't play very well. Just that people are hitting everything he's thrown. And uh, he went to his coach, and his coach sent him to a therapy, a therapist that said, are you having any emotional problems? And he said, yeah. He said, I'm not pitching good, and I think I'm gonna lose my job. $30 million job is the worst, you know. If you work at McDonald's and you lose your job, you can't get that upset about it. But if you're making $30 million a year and they go, I'm sorry, uh, you'll have to go work at Burger King. Uh, it's a whole lifestyle change. So uh, somebody mentioned me to him and he said, well, I've heard about stuff like that. I don't believe in things like that. But then he started thinking about the 30 million. So he uh, called me on the phone and I said, uh, I said, look, I said, he said, I don't believe in hypnosis. And I said, good, makes it easier. <laughs> I said, uh, what do you want from me? And he said, well, he said, I want to be able to pitch as good as I was pitching before. And I said, you have no imagination, so I can't take you as a client. And he said, what? And I said, you don't want to pitch better than you pitched before? And he said, I didn't know that that was a choice. I said, therein lies your problem. I said, uh, when you're ready to make a serious change, maybe give me a call. Otherwise, why don't you go to therapy and whine? He said, uh, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> He showed up and he said, how much is this gonna cost an hour? And I said, I don't charge by the hour. I said, I want 5% of the increase in your salary. You do better, they pay you more money, I just want 5% of it for the next two years. So if I don't do anything, it doesn't cost you a nickel. And he went, <laughs> so, so basically this is free. And I said, no, basically this is gonna be really expensive. <laughs> He had the best year of his life. They upped his salary to $37 million a year. And I didn't work for four years. <laughs> I sat in Hawaii with my toes on the balcony, cash and checks. <laughs> People calling up going, Richard, I'm really depressed. And I go, boy, I'm not. <laughs> Sucks to be depressed, man. I feel really wonderful. <laughs> But let me give you the name of somebody that might be able to help you. Because uh, uh, think about it. I, I, when I started out at 35 years ago, I didn't even intend to do any of this. It's just that I'm a relentless person. I never give up. I never stop. When I get locked onto something, that's it. You know, I always tell my clients, we can do this easy. We can do it hard. We're just not going to do it slow because I'm not a patient man. You know, you're going to change or you're going to die while I'm trying. That's just the way it works. People tell me these things, they go, ah, because most of it's just a learning thing. I've started doing classes now at taking people who were, how many of you were told in elementary school that you were not artistic? Yeah, I mean, just think of the concept of it, just to start with. It's totally absurd. But I found out this is a worldwide event. There are people that do not paint or draw in any way, shape, or form, or don't sing or don't play music 
because an elementary school teacher told him when by went, uh, see, I was in the se I was in the second grade. I wasn't really very sophisticated, but I had moved. I was I had already been to like twelve schools because I, I moved around a lot, and uh, they put a bowl of fruit on the table and they gave me uh, crayons, and they said uh, draw the bowl of fruit and the crayons, and I started to draw on the fruit, and they said no no on the paper, and I went huh. They said, the guy next to me had the thing that looked like a photograph. Absolutely perfect. The anal retentive kid, the, the wood the same, you know. You know, he's never taken a shit in 50 years of his life, probably. But he can make that fruit perfect. And I tried to draw it, and I couldn't even get the circle for the bowl down there. Plus, I wasn't really that interested. But this teacher took me and shook me like this and said, You'll never be artistic. And it went, mm -hmm. So for years and years and years, I never ever picked up a paintbrush, never did anything. Just was stuck in my mind, never even thought about it. A music teacher also told me I was not, uh, I would never be able to play music because I couldn't play a little plastic flute. They gave us each a plastic flute and, uh, and a little piece of music that had the song Yankee Doodle Dandy, and, uh, which is not one of my favorite hits, by the way. Um, <laughs> told us to go home and learn it that night, and the next day they had everybody, one at a time, play it. And I had forgotten to bring the flute home. <laughs> it just wasn't one of those things, because I didn't like that song. So I picked it up and went <laughs> And they looked at, he looked at me and he said, you'll never be able to play music. Uh, oops, I've recorded over 37 full albums of music that I've composed and played every instrument. I guess he was wrong. But the art thing slipped by. I didn't even think about it until my wife mentioned it. We went by an art store and she said to me and she said, let's buy a bunch of paints and stay up all night and paint. And I said, uh, you mean the wall? And she said, no, 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 on canvas. And I went, mm, I am not artistic. She went, what's the matter with you? You look like you're in a trance. And I went, mm. and I thought about that teacher in the second grade. So I called her on the fucking phone from London. <coughs> she was like 89. Who is this? It's the middle of the night. I said, you bitch. <laughs> you fucked me up my whole life. You told me I wasn't artistic. She said, who are you? And I said, uh, my name's Richard Bandler. And she said, oh, you're the one with the bad fruit bowl. <laughs> that sounds absurd, isn't it? How many of you are not painting? Think about it. See, because I did this thing. I, I was seeing this guy was down on the Thames painting these lovely trees and bushes and stuff. And I asked the guy, I walked up to him and I said, I, said, I don't want to really impose, but I just am that kind of guy. Uh, let me ask you, I said, uh, how are you getting a tree on the outside onto the fucking canvas? Because I tried it and everything I do looks like a modern art. Very modern art. But then I sort of like it that way. It reminds me of the 60s. But I wanted to know this, how this guy did this. So he said to me, he said, well, he said, it's really not that hard. He said, he said, the first thing you do is you get your palette and you get the color so the color looks like the same as the leaf. He pointed to the leaf and I said, yeah. He said, and then what you do, he said, is you put your arm over the canvas and you imagine the same arm over the leaf in the tree. So he's got an arm in the tree and this tree is like 20 fucking yards away, okay? And, and I've said to, I said to this guy, I said, the arm in the tree? And he said, yeah, yeah the arm in the tree. They, they, I tell you, they teach you that in art school, don't you? Everybody hallucinate a big arm in the tree. Um, and he said, but I tried it. I, mean, I said, okay. And he said, and then put a wire between the arm, your arm, and the arm in the tree. So that when the one does the leaf like this, it comes around perfectly. And when you do this up here in the center, and each thing comes out perfect. And he said, and then you just keep doing it with finer and finer detail. And I went, that'd work, wouldn't it? I went, hmm. And I said, and you can do this with faces? And he said, oh, you have to do it with faces. He said, because you have to get all the shading just right. You have to check the color of each thing, do each shade and each thing just the same. So the arm moves it like that. He, <laughs> and you know what was cool? He'd done this so long, he talked to me and it would do it by itself. He didn't even have to look at it. That's how long he'd been doing it. Of course, he sells paintings for like three and four million bucks. But 
you guys wouldn't be interested in stuff like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that I think artistic expression, one of the things that makes this a great country uh, is, and uh, Paul, I was talking to Paul McKenna and he said he loves to do shows in Ireland better than anywhere because people have a better sense of humor and they understand language better. People tell stories here, people play music more, people just in general like to have fun more in this country than in other countries. Mexico is a lot like that. Mexico is a very fun place to go. Then there are some other countries like the one I grew up in uh, where we have a work ethic and uh, ethic where you have two choices. You either must be an alcoholic and a total uh, lunatic or you must be a Baptist um, and do things like be a total hypocrite. You go out and sin and then you confess and get forgiven. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists, I, I love these Seventh-day Adventists. They, they had that woman, Mary Baker Ader, told everybody the world was going to end on a certain day. And everybody uh, didn't plant crops and they all went up on the mountaintop and waited for Armageddon and it didn't happen. And yet it's still one of the biggest churches around. And every, and every year they celebrate that day. It's called the Big Disappointment. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Just incorporate it right in. Fast. That's it. You know, just give it a name and it goes away. See, that's the trouble with diagnosing problems. As soon as you call that man a catatonic, they stopped talking to him. See, we, I even worked with people in comas. And uh, somebody I knew, uh, their sister was in a coma, been in a coma for about four months. And uh, I, went, I drove them to the hospital and they said I couldn't go in because I wasn't a relative. And I said, I said, I'm her husband. And <laughs> they went, oh, we didn't know. So I got to go in. Uh, I was married in the church of, uh, I can lie really fast. Um, but I went in and there she was, she was hooked up to all this stuff, had machines flashing and all this stuff. This is really sad because, I mean, she'd been a very vibrant girl and got in a car accident. And, but there was nobody in the room with her. There's nothing but this thing going... Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. And another one that went beep, beep, beep. And he sat down and he held her hand and he talked to her and he said he came in every day and he did this. And I said to him, I said, do you tell her to wake up? And he said, what? And I said, let's try it. And I put my hand on her chest and I just paced her breathing. So I moved my hand the same little bit that her breathing. And since she had a breathing thing on, it was really easy to do because it was like, that and I just follow it. But I found out after a while, if I lifted my hand just a little bit higher, her breathing went a little bit higher. And then I said, I know you can hear me. And I said, uh, what I'm going to do is reach down. I, I'm going to take and I'm going to lift up your finger. And I took her finger and I lifted it up. And I said, and I want you to hold that finger just like that. And I said, now, if you're unconscious, can hear me, lower the finger quickly. And it went like that. And I went, cool. And I said, now, if you're unconscious, really wants you to wake up, lift your finger up. And it went like this. And I went, this is going to be a piece of cake. We need some doctors to scare. <laughs> so I said, in a minute, I'm going to bring some gentlemen in the room. And when I say, wake up, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to wake up. I said, and if you're willing to do that, lift your finger up again. And it went like that. I said, cool. See you in a few minutes. So I went out and I collected four or five doctors just at random, you can tell them because they have stethoscopes and when you grab them by the stethoscope, they can't get away. <laughs> Especially if you can get it behind them. But I dragged these guys, I said, there's something going on in the other room. I said, you have to see this. And I brought them all in and I said, I said this woman is not awake. And they went, well, uh, she's in a, a, a coma. This guy took the chart and went, she said, uh, she's been in a coma since uh, May 29th. And I said, yeah, but she's not talking or opening her eyes or anything. And they said, well, that's what a coma is. And I said, no, it's not. And I looked at her and I said, wake up. And her eyes opened and she began to choke on the tube they had on her throat. And they took the thing out. She sat up and she spit. And she went, am I late for school? And she was like 20, 32 years old, I think. So she was obviously in goo goo dreamland. Uh, but then I looked at the bottle on the table. Listen to this. Uh, the stuff they put on the throat when they put the tube down. 
It's called cocaine hydrochloride. Uh, so if you're going to dream, that's a good way to start, I guess. Um, but I'm surprised they didn't wake them up, but I, apparently they weren't taking it properly. Uh, but if you don't tell people to wake up, why would they? Now, I worked with other coma people where it wasn't that easy. Uh, sometimes you have to, you know, do things which take more time. We made tapes and played it all the time. For example, uh, when I sent, the, I sent the tape to the coma maintenance ward, they have six people and a nurse just sitting in there. And these people just, they rotate them so they don't get bed sores. So I sent tapes for them to just play and a, a big ghetto blaster to play them on. For example, one is just the telephone ringing incessantly on a tape loop. <laughs> one is somebody whispering, you better get up or you'll be late. <laughs> um, stuff like that. Uh, we found out that uh, some people respond to that. But to me, it's just trying. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. But if we don't keep trying, we won't find the things that work. We can't know what won't work. It's not in the cards. You see, everything that was impossible in the past seems to end up being possible. My grandfather, bless his soul, uh, he, uh, he ate out of aluminum cans a little bit too much. He kind of got Alzheimer's. Uh, and for example, when he was, uh, I guess, 97, I was on my way to London and he told me not to go there. He said, the place is bombed out. He'd seen it. And uh, I told him that was 50 years ago. And he said, that, he said, I can it was. He said, it was just yesterday. Then he called me Frank. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he did say something which I think is really smart. Uh, he outlived four doctors who told him he was supposed to die from smoking, uh, which I think b believing things is that he never believed anybody, so he didn't die. He made a good choice. With all of my clients, the first thing I do is I believe that they can get where they need to go and they can get there today. Not in a month. I'm not a patient man. I don't do slow therapy. I do it quick and with an axe because I don't think humans can learn slowly. If I drew a stick figure on a pad of paper and I handed you one sheet a week for five fucking years, you'd have no idea what happened. But if I take the same pad and I flip it by, you'll see the stick figure get up, walk across the room, and fly like a bird. Your brain learns by patterning, so things have to go by. As soon as he ran a different feeling by, differently. If I ask you to come up here now, are you afraid? No. You got on a new man, Michael. And of course, you know what the side effects of that are. <laughs> Not only will they happen to Michael, it's very contagious. <laughs> now, you can take the suggestions from the people that you went to school with. The teachers that said, oh, you're not artistic. You can't be a good lover. I was telling you, the night before I got married, all of these people told me, they said, well, you yes, better enjoy sex when you first get together, it's great, but as the years go by, you know, like that. And I went, what? You mean you practice something and get worse at it? I was a musician. That didn't make any sense to me. That's like you start out playing like Jimi Hendrix, and after a few years, you can't play chords. It doesn't make any sense. You know, you start out with a great singing voice, and then you end up being, not being able to hit a note. I mean, it seems to me the better, more you do something, the better you would get at it. And they said, oh, no, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Life is not good. But my grandfather told me, he said, oh, those assholes tell you that. He said, just remember, whenever anybody tells you anything that doesn't sound like it's fun and it's going to be great, they must be a stupid liar. And I thought, that's good advice. Because believing is what makes things real not the opposite. One time on this planet, there was no cars, and somebody thought one up, and now the damn things are everywhere. At one time, there were no houses. Somebody thought, Jesus, it's cold in this fucking cave, especially in Ireland, damn. Actually, the caves are pretty warm, but you know, the rest of the country is freezing. You know, I love being here in the summer because I, was, I grew up in San Francisco. You know, I don't, I'm like the sun. I go to L.A., you know, and the sun creeps under the door and shines everywhere. It's nauseating to me. I like it to rain a little bit. I like things that are green and lush, you know. But when I went to the jungle, it was also hot. I hated that. I went, up, I went to meet this holy man that was supposed to do all this healing stuff. 
a great guy. By the time I got there, I was in such a bad mood. It was like, you know, grab the guy by the throat. I said, okay, tell me all your secrets. You got one fucking hour. You know, I want to get back to my hotel and get some air conditioning. It took me three days to get up there in some fucking little boat eating worms and shit. You know, excuse me. You know, if he was so wise, what the fuck was he doing out there? He, was, he did some pretty cool tricks, though, I have to admit. Um, but, you know, he did a healing thing with this woman that had this uh, growth on her hand, some terrible thing. And the doctors that brought me down said, oh, he does some things, he must use magic herbs. <laughs> he didn't use anything. <laughs> I saw him. He took this woman's hand, he looked at it, and they couldn't cure this disease. They had brought this woman from Cincinnati, and a uh, very uncomfortable trip. But the <laughs> witch doctor looked at him, didn't even speak any English, looked the woman in the eye, and he went like this, and he went, and he smacked her in the forehead, and her eyes closed, and uh, she just went into this trance, and there's like, by the way, 300 natives sitting around going, hum hum you know. it gives a little effect, I guess, you know, big fire in the middle, like that, and then he's, he went and he touched her eyes, and she opened her eyes, and he put his hand down like this, and he went, started drawing circles. And as he went like this, the whole thing disappeared. Now here's the cool part. She, part of this was from some uh, thing where she hurt her hand and her fingers didn't move either. The nerves were destroyed, quote unquote, that's what the doctor told me. And this growth was some gangrene secondary grafting infection, right? <laughs> he goes like this, like, and it just went away before our eyes. Sat there looking at it and I went, wow, this is cool. And the doctors are going, this is hypnosis. And I'm going, yes, this is hypnosis. And then he goes like this. He looks at her and he goes, like this. He goes, she, and she goes like this and opens and closes her hands. And one of the doctors stands up and goes, okay, that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I was forced to grab him by the gonads and pull him back down. I, I find you don't get much argument that way. Um, and I kept a hold of him so he wouldn't say anything else and get us killed. Um, but uh, he, he go, went like this, and she kept going like this. And this doctor sat there the whole time explaining. He goes, look, we, we, we have things and the nerves are actually destroyed. These, the nerves have been severed. The fingers cannot move. The fingers, I said, the fingers are moving now. And he said, he said it has to be an illusion. <laughs> so I said, let's try it. So I whispered to her, I said, take your finger and poke him in the eye. <laughs> and she went, <laughs> and sure enough, it wasn't an illusion. She's still, it's been, it's been probably about 12 years, she still can move her hand, and they still can examine it and prove the nerves are not connected. <laughs> so, but she didn't know about it, so she still can move her hand. Uh, just shows you ignorance is a good thing. They keep telling me that I keep doing things with uh, patients and I'm told you can't do them. Uh, I've got learning disabled children uh, they were suffering from a new diagnosis that was made up. Uh, these, uh, these kids were lystexic. Um, the, uh, lyst lystexia is a terrible problem. Uh, that meant that they couldn't read and they couldn't spell. And uh, so I took them for three hours, put them back in the classroom and they could and because uh, I didn't read the manual and they told me you just can't do this and I said well you should have told me that before I did this because I, I didn't know that I thought all I had to do is hypnotize them and uh, make them believe that they already could and tell them how it's done and then have them go back and rewrite their entire life as if they already could and not believe anything that anybody told them and always feel good about themselves and of course but they, they said that would be a lie <laughs> well 12 years later it's still not a lie but you see, until we try new things, and uh, what NLP is, and now you're a part of it, think of it, every continent except Antarctica, and there's probably somebody there sitting there trying to stay warm by imagining something. But right now, there are people doing NLP all over the face of the earth. I've, sold, uh, I've published in 45 languages. I've written over 30 books. I write children's stories under pseudonyms. <laughs> I get away with all kinds of stuff that way. If they don't know it's me, they don't, they don't know to be afraid. <laughs> it's just, I get to do all kinds of stuff. I've made cartoons for children. Because I just don't want them to be afraid when they don't need to. There's no need to be afraid. Not anymore. If he doesn't have to be afraid, neither do you. 
And if you realize that the bad feelings that you manufacture, you're just good at them. Now, it's one thing. People most of the time will just ask to get rid of the bad ones. But once the pitcher decided that he could have a better feeling than he ever had, I taught him to see the world in slow motion. Just like that one second before you avoid a car wreck, I made it so he could do that on command. So that when the batter was moving, he could see it so he could throw the ball. His fastball <laughs> uh, ended up being a record-breaking fastball. And he knew exactly what the batter was going to do ahead of time. I also gave him precognition. I studied that too. Just a slightly different application for it. These kinds of things happen all the time. If you think about it, a little tiny piece of plastic like this, a computer memory, you have one of those little ROM things in your computer with all this stuff on it. It's just magnetic stuff, little piece of stuff with magnetics. The Earth is a big disk with a magnetic field around it. That magnetic field is moving. So every idea that ever was and is is going through you all the time. So if you open your imagination up, get rid of a few of those old rules, get your finger out of your mouth, <laughs> and start going, I'm not taking any shit. You don't have to give anybody any shit. But we're certainly not going to let our kids live the way we did. They used to hit me because I was left-handed with a stick. I was a tried to write with a pencil with my left hand. That's how sophisticated the world was when I was growing up. But then, we didn't even have color TV then. But my grandfather, you know, he said if man were meant to fly, he'd have wings. So we built us some. And now we can fly uh, all over the fucking universe. Pretty soon we're going to figure out how to go through space. Things aren't getting worse, things are getting better. But if you focus on what's wrong, you get to find out what it is. If you look for what can go wrong, you get to find it. But if you look for the easy, quick solution, Sigmund Freud would have been talking to this guy about his fucking mother and his dreams and, uh, you know, sexual fantasies, every fucking thing under the sun, watching that bank account roll out, rather than thinking, how do you give a man more freedom? How do you give a woman more freedom to be able to do whatever she wants? And it doesn't matter whether you're black or you're white or you're Muslim or you're Catholic or you're Jewish or you're just a fucking lunatic like me. We all share one thing in common, our neurology. And that's the key. It's the answer. Once you learn to run your neurology, then you can do things. People who can't memorize names, well, I can teach you how to do it. Kevin Trudeau has a commercial on TV and he claims that it's tape set will help you to do it. And I met him and he told me they faked the whole commercial. So he has lots of money, but guess what he doesn't have? He doesn't have the ability to feel good about himself. There's only one way to get that. If you do good things for the right reason, you'll always feel good about it. And uh, you'll get a lot of shit for doing that. But it uh, doesn't mean you have to feel bad. I've been getting shit my whole life for everything I've done. And I just smile back at him. Think inside my head, just wait, asshole. Yeah. You know what my Psych 1A college professor? I flunked Psych 1A. And now she has to go to seminars and study my work. I've been plagiarized. My work has been plagiarized by people all over the planet. Steal my ideas and go out and teach them to people all over the world. So they're doing my work for me. Either way I win. Can't lose. Once you've let your mind go, because as soon as you aim towards success, you're going to get there. Anyway, I guess you guys are getting a little hungry. And I know there are pacing people in the back of the room signaling me things like, we're running out of tape. Guess what? I don't care. <laughs> I'm not quite done yet. So we're going to take a little lunch break. Uh, how long do you think you guys need for lunch? An hour and a half or two hours? He said no, he doesn't need any lunch. Okay, so you can just lay on the street. Uh, an, hour, an hour and a half would probably be enough. An hour, an hour and 41 minutes. How's that? Uh, but it doesn't start now, so looking at your watch is a total hypnotic command. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted you to lift your arm involuntarily so while I stick these suggestions in. Oh yeah, you can't get me to respond, I didn't do this. <laughs> I love conscious incorporation. You see, we're all responding all the time and that's a good thing. When I was at Esalen, they said people can't make each other feel things. 
And I, you know what, I looked at the guy that said that to me and raised one eyebrow and he became terrified. I went, <laughs> and I made him feel something different. I said, I didn't even touch you and I made you feel different. And he said, well, he said, if we were truly authenticated, we'd have no impact on each other. Well, guess what? When I yell at that chair, it doesn't respond as much as a person, but it does respond. The molecules do vibrate. Uh, I'm more interested in people than I am in furniture. And, I, and I'm more interested in becoming more of a person than becoming more furniture. Um, I did see on TV the other night, there are some people now who have a fetish. They want to be lamps and stuff. Uh, these are people I think really need to examine their decision strategies. Because think for a minute now. Every single one of you have made a good decision in your life. There's something you decided you wanted, and you either did it or you bought it. And when you think about it now, it was the right thing, you made the right choice, and you're happy with it. Now stop and think about it, and where's the picture? Point to it. Right? Even if you can't see the picture, you know where it is. Because I know somebody, what picture? What picture? What picture? What picture? If you know what it is, there's a picture somewhere. Now, okay, if you also know that you made a decision in your life that sucks, and at the time, you know, maybe you weren't sure about it or whatever, but you did it anyhow, and you've always regretted it, I'll bet you a dime on a dollar the picture from that is in a different place. Isn't it? Now, here's the trick. The future is coming up any second now, and it's happening all the time. The best thing about the past, by the way, is that it's over. <laughs> A lot of people forget that. They come in and they want to tell me about their past, and I'm forced, I always look at my clients, I go, excuse me, ask one more word about your past, and I'll have to slap the shit out of you. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not allowed to hear about this stuff. And they go, but, and I go, hey, 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 don't think I won't, you know. I've been sued by so many people, there's nothing left, so I'm not afraid. You know, I do what I do for a living because I enjoy it. And that's why you should do things, is because you enjoy it. I don't do it because I'm inherently helpful. I'm just ornery, that's all there is to it. They told me, they said, oh, they said, you know, you can't help these people. Excuse me, I'm depressed. You know how you get a depressed person to not be depressed? You teach them how to have fun. Because if you ask them, you know, well, do you know how to have fun? And they go, well, I guess so. They go, that's not it. Okay, you have to go deeper down. You have to find the right button. You have to press the right enzymes, the right hormones. Now, when you make decisions, right, the one that felt perfect and you knew was perfect, you know where that picture is. Take a look at it. Anything that appears in that place in the future is probably something you should do. On the other hand, the stuff that appears in the other location with the bad decision, that stock that someone offers you, if it pops up over there, don't buy it. Because you're a sophisticated machine. You're an organism. Capable, the brain is capable of doing biological things, spiritual things, it, the same thing that can remember names, calculate numbers, learn history, even though it's a lie. That's why they call it his story. There's <laughs> his story this year will be, oh yes, the American Revolution. Uh, well, think about it. The French Revolution is the only war the French ever won. <laughs> and they were on both sides of it. <laughs> So, we won't go to them to learn how to win wars. Actually, I think the best way to win wars is to not be in them. Because, uh, what, what would it look like from people from outer space? Looking at this planet that keeps attacking itself. They go, look at, look at Earth. They're shooting, each, they're shooting each other again. They just took a nuclear bomb and blew, out, blew up their own planet. They did, they took a nuclear, they're testing nuclear bombs. We know they work, you don't have to test them. First one they set off, by the way, and this is the truth, they did not know if the chain reaction would stop or not. It would either stop or it would burn the atmosphere off of the planet Earth and kill every living thing on it. So they tried it to find out. I, I, this, is, this, is, this is true, dear. That, I believe, goes in the bad decision category. 
Okay. Fortunately, in our lives, most of us don't have to make that big of decisions about whether to end all life on the planet or not. Uh, we can stick with smaller things like, should I have one more beer or not? Should I drive my car when I feel like this? Uh, I read the newspaper uh, a couple of days ago. I always get the Irish newspaper because it has the, the best things in that thing you read up where the, guard, the guards list all the recent crimes. Uh, crimes, in, crimes in Ireland are much more original than other places, like most everything else. I mean, Ireland's got James Joyce. <laughs> you realize that they banned that book? You can't even read it, let alone ban it. <laughs> How did they know it was pornography? You know, there's 600 books written about the one book, and none of them agree on what it is, but yet they knew it was pornographic. I, uh, I mean, they have no idea. How can you ban... But of course, in America, they banned the dictionary because it had bad words in it. <laughs> this is the country that's supposed to have all the freedom in it. The Webster's Dictionary was banned, you know, because it had words like penis in it, you know, and vulgar things like that. So it was considered terrible. It's because, you know, most people say, well, the best way to protect people is to keep them ignorant. You know, if you're not exposed to things, you know, because I, I believe people should be exposed to the things that give them choice. I mean, not as children, I don't, think, I don't think that, you know, kids should be watching, you know, pornography. But I don't think that we should be uh, creating industries out of it by making it illegal. Instead, we should come up with better things. We should teach people how to make good choices. Good choices about what to eat, good choices about what to feel. Because every moment, of every second of every day of your life can be special or not. Most people don't choose about that and they don't plan for it. They don't plan for it in their marriage, they don't plan for it with their children, they don't plan for it in their businesses and they're with their employees. And if you start to make every moment magic, you start to get success beyond comprehension. The stuff that I've done in 30 years uh, it's absolutely, I, I wouldn't have ever thought that anyone could do these things. I didn't even know most of them even existed. Uh, I've gotten to do things. The American government let me drive the hydrofoil that goes 80 miles an hour across the water, carries 400 men, right, and goes up onto the beach at 60 miles an hour. Before the military had M1 tanks, I got to drive one, right, because I was designing training programs. And as a kid, I didn't even play Army. But I had fun. I got to go to El Paso, Texas, and go in there and said, well, let us show you how the tank works. And they said, get in and drive around. That was their training program. Not highly sophisticated. For example, the, the, the military program for uh, being able to be accurate with a gun was they put a target out 25 yards away, handed you a gun, and said, shoot that. I think gun safety is hitting what you aim at. You know, and I think that's true for policemen, for people in the military, or anyone. That it's the same thing with fists. You know, fist control is hitting what you aim at, right? So that you don't hit somebody when you don't intend to. You know, it's like if people don't understand how things work, then they just don't work well. And so the, a, a client who came in and uh, he told me he was unable to masturbate. And I said, I beg your pardon? I said, uh, you want to be able to masturbate? I said, usually uh, people find that's pretty easy. And he said, well, he said, I've been trying it. And I said, uh, I said, I said, uh, I said, I said uh, I, you must not be doing this right. And he said, well, he said, I, I do a single stroke every day, but I've never had an orgasm. Of course, this guy runs a mental hospital. I'm not lying about that. A big mental hospital. He said, and you know the difference between people who work in mental hospitals and the patients? The patients can get well and go home. <laughs> if you don't believe that people can get well, if you don't believe that people can be happier, if you don't believe that you can turn around and magically, from this day forward, make your relationships better, your business better, your life better, Guess what? You're wrong. And I know it because I know there's more magic than anybody else does because I've seen it. I hunted it down all over the planet. I found anybody who could do anything that couldn't be explained 
and sat down and went into trances and did everything and tried it myself. They said no one could do hypnosis like Milton. And I can even hypnotize his relatives by imitating him. I was a good musician. I learned to play songs by listening to records. I can do his tonality, his intonation. I can do his voice with such precision that when people who know Milton met me, I went and did it. I gave a lecture at the society that he founded after his death. When Patterns One came out, they asked me, they said, uh, well, we wanted you to come talk about Milton, you know, because he had died just recently. And I went in and there were 200 of them in the audience that had not met me, so they didn't know what I sounded like. I walked in and I said, hello, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Richard Bandler. I'm from California. And I'd like to talk to you about Milton H. Erickson, MD, Phoenix, Arizona. And I want to talk to you about his work in a trance. Because your unconscious knows a lot about trance. Isn't that a great ambiguity, by the way? The phrase, you're unconscious, is a command, by the way. It's not a person. When you look at somebody and you say, your unconscious wants to learn. Your unconscious needs to know new ways of doing things that you haven't yet learned. But in the future soon, you're going to find that there's a lot you don't understand about what's not important, about what you're not doing. But yet, in the future, before you try and stop yourself from denying the fact that you don't understand what isn't important about what you don't care about, you're going to find out that what you care about will clearly begin to develop. Because most certainly, while you've been listening, your unconscious has been close enough to hear. And how else would I celebrate 30 years of NLP? By sticking something in your mind so that without your understanding it, everything starts to get better mysteriously. And the stuff that really bothered you is just not going to work. It's going to go backwards. Words back, backwards. Lunch now, now lunch. Out, go, go out. And I tell you what, you come back in an hour and 41 minutes and the boys that run the institute here are going to run you through a few things and then I'm going to come back later and we're going to talk some more. So I'll see you guys in a few hours. Thank you. Uh.